It was a normal Monday morning. I was standing by my locker when this Layla girl walked over, leaned against the locker next to mine, and talked to me in this sultry voice. Hi, handsome. Do you have any plans after school? I looked around in confusion. Huh? Was she talking to me? Usually girls like Layla didn't talk to guys like me. I mean, come on, look at her. She's the hottest girl in school. While I'm Felix, <laughs> just your average looking nerdy guy. I awkwardly replied, Oh, hi, uh, I'm just doing my homework after school, bye. Then I left her there dumbfounded. But it didn't end there. At the end of school, she approached me again and asked, Do you want to hang out with me? Followed by a wink. Uh, no thanks, uh, I really have to finish my paper on the French Revolution. Then I walked off. Man, did she really want to hang out with me? <laughs> no way. She must have lost a bet or something. Even on the next day, Layla, one more time, made a beeline for me with this scary, determined look on her face while I was chatting with my friends. And in a serious tone, she said, Look, Felix, do you want to be my boyfriend? What? All my friends started to cheer. I was so embarrassed that I shooed them away to get some privacy with Layla. Um, I'm flattered, but no. She scowled at me. Excuse me? Do you realize that I'm Layla Hall, the prettiest and most popular girl in this entire school? Not to mention a member of the cheerleading team? Ugh, cheerleaders are so dramatic. I calmly replied, Sorry, but you're just not my type. She shouted back, What? I'm everybody's type! I just shrugged and left. My god, that was awkward. But at least she got the hint now, right? Well, wrong. Because that's when the trouble just began. Firstly, it was this flood of junk emails and newsletters. Then strange phone calls from the spa nail salon asking if I had made appointment for the day, which I obviously didn't. On top of that, there's a fake Facebook account that started spreading unflattering pictures of me around, picking my nose in French class, pulling this weird tongue-out concentration face as I checked over my essay. There was even a slow-mo clip of me chewing like a camel as I enjoyed my burger. Man, I was an ugly eater. While I was scrolling through these pics, Layla jumped out at me with a big smirk on her face. Be my boyfriend, then the pranks will stop. Right, uh, of course it was her. Didn't she have better things to do? I shook my head and said, Pfft, no thanks. This still beats being with an annoying girl like you. Then a few days later, as I walked into school, I noticed that everyone was giving me dirty looks. Was my shirt inside out or something? Nope. So what was the problem? I asked some of my friends and, geez. Layla told everyone that I kissed her, then ghosted her. She's a real-life Harley Quinn. Hot, but totally crazy. Only a lunatic like the Joker could love her. I'd had enough of her antics. I couldn't let her make me look like the bad guy for something I didn't do. So at lunch, I charged over to her table and yelled in her face. Are you crazy? Why can't you understand that I don't like you? Then I shouted so everyone could hear me. Hey, listen, this rumor about me kissing and ghosting Layla is a total lie. She made it all up because I refused to date her. So please, save your dirty looks for someone else. Thank you. Layla shoved past me and ran out of there. Ugh, okay, maybe I was a little harsh. But you'd brought it on yourself, princess. Then, during French class, she was absent, but no one knew where she went. Was it maybe because of me? Nah, probably not. But as I was walking home, I spotted her sitting alone on a swing in the playground. Just go, Felix. This girl only brings trouble, I thought to myself. But oh man, she looked so sad. So the next thing I knew, I was walking over and sat on the swing next to her. I asked... Why weren't you in French class? Just leave me alone. Stop pretending you care. Look. I took a deep breath, then continued. <sighs> I'm sorry for yelling at you in front of the whole school. That, that wasn't cool. But what you did to me wasn't cool either. Shall we call it even? Layla stayed quiet for a bit, but then she nodded and smiled at me. Well, that wasn't so bad, right? So from then onward, everything was fine between us. She even smiled at me in the hallway. Whenever I saw Layla, this warm feeling came over me, and I couldn't stop grinning. Once, I even spent my entire lunch break trapezing around school just so I could catch a glimpse of her face. Oh boy, I think I've fallen for Layla. But why now? I tried to ignore these feelings, hoping they'd eventually go away. But then Valentine's Day came along, and Layla, being the popular girl she is, received enough roses to open a florist. Ugh, how annoying. I needed to do something. So after school, I went to her house with some chocolates and a teddy bear. As soon as she opened the door, I blurted out, I know I'm a big dumb idiot. Rejecting you was a huge mistake. Please, will you be my valentine? I stood there red-faced and prepared for rejection. But she just snatched the gift out of my hands, then said, Yeah, okay then. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. 
Me, your regular nerdy guy, was dating the most popular girl in school. Love is really unpredictable. I was amazed at how open she was to my nerdy stuff. She even watched The Mandalorian with me and cooed whenever she saw Baby Yoda. But the one thing that didn't gel so well between us was, yep, you guessed it, studying. Layla didn't seem to care about her grades, and I didn't want her to fail, so I offered to be her tutor. But she was constantly yawning and staring out of the window whenever we started studying. Felix, I have an idea. Why don't you do my homework for me? In the meantime, I can go to cheerleading practice as we have an important contest coming up, and it means the world to me, just like your math quizzes do to you. What? Was she serious? My God, I hated cheating like this. But she gave me that puppy-eyed look, and me being the sucker I am, I agreed. Thanks, Felix. You're the best. She kissed me on the cheek, then immediately passed me a huge pile of homework. I asked her why she had so much, and she explained that because she didn't understand it, she let them pile up. But hold on. Why did she have Spanish? She was in French class with me, not Spanish. But she just shrugged and said her parents forced her to study it outside of school. Oh, my poor little pumpkin. One day, like usual, I stopped by her place to pick up her homework, but she wasn't home. That was odd. Today wasn't cheerleading practice, so where could she be? I looked through the stack that she asked her mom to give me and saw some Spanish worksheets. So I said to her mom, Oh, she must be in her Spanish lesson, right? Her mom looked a bit confused and laughed. <laughs> you know Layla. She's far too stubborn to agree to extra classes. Huh? So the papers weren't hers? Then whose it was? And why? Suddenly I felt this uncomfortable feeling itching under my skin. I decided to confront her later at school. Then the next day I was walking through the hallway looking for Layla when I suddenly heard some guys cheering, something about getting an A in Spanish. Wait a minute, did he say Spanish? I turned to see who it was, and to my shock it was Hector, the captain of the soccer team. Hector was popular for being all handsome and everything, but also for sucking at school. Someone must have done his homework for him, and you guessed it, yeah. This someone was me. Ah, it all made sense now. Layla and Hector must be a couple. They may have been hot stuff, but they both sucked at studying. So she was using me to do both of their homework. It all made much more sense now. None of this relationship was real. It was all just an act. And no way was I letting them get away with this. I had a perfect plan to expose them. During lunch, I sat down at the table closest to Hector. Then I went into lovey-dovey overload with Layla. I fed her cheese fries, then I stroked her hair and loudly told her how soft it was. I quickly glanced over at Hector for his reaction, but nothing. He seemed more interested in her burger than her. Layla raised an eyebrow at me. Um, are you okay? You're acting really weird. I laughed loudly, then placed my arms around her, then said, well, um, it was actually more like shouting. Oh, because you're so cute! But huh? Why was there still no reaction from Hector? He and his friends even cheered, and on his way out of the canteen, he gave me a thumbs up. Layla didn't look phased at all either. Man, somebody call the Academy, because these two deserved an Oscar. My plan was a massive fail. Ugh, this was so frustrating. I fell silent, and Layla noticed and gave me this quizzing look. Something is definitely off. You're being really strange. Okay, if she wanted to know, then fine. So I blurted out. I know that the Spanish papers belong to Hector. You're together and you're just using me to do all your homework. I'm not stupid, you know. Nice meeting you, but please don't ever talk to me again. Then I left without saying a word. Well, that's the end of my story. A rather sad one, right? I would be lying if I said I wasn't feeling down about it. I truly do love her. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to college in a few months and I'll get to meet a cute, geeky girl who won't trick me into doing some other dude's homework. <sighs> oh, uh, sorry guys, someone's calling me. My god, it's Layla. What does she want? We're done. Stop calling. What? Fine. Promise you'll leave me alone after this? Okay, wait. I'm coming downstairs. Uh, oh my god. Layla's at my front door and she insists to not leave unless I have a talk with her. Ugh. Don't move, everyone. I'll tell you every detail as soon as I'm back. Jesus, guys. You won't believe what Layla's just told me. The thing is that her cheerleading team had to practice a lot for upcoming contests, which means they couldn't study as much. Therefore, they had to find someone who was willing to do their homework so their grades wouldn't slip. That's when Layla came up with the plan to win me over as her boyfriend. The flirting, the pranks, <laughs> they were all part of her plan. That was the truth. But Layla didn't know about the Spanish worksheets because her teammate Harper gave them to her. Turns out Hector is Harper's boyfriend. Didn't see that coming, right? But I was still super mad at Layla because she still used me. Then Layla took out some papers and showed them to me. Huh? It was homework with all B's on them. Then she told me, okay, I admit that at first I didn't like you. I only approached you to take advantage of you. 
but then I actually fell for you as I got to know you better, okay? So I stopped giving you my homework and did it on my own. So, her feelings for me were real too? I couldn't believe it. Eventually, I forgave her and now we're happier than ever. I must say, when Layla first talked to me, I thought she was this crazy girl like Harley Quinn who I could never like, but I was wrong. Turns out I'm the one who's crazy about her. So, I guess I have more in common with the Joker than I first thought. <laughs> So, my dream of conquering Hollywood and becoming a world-renowned actress is finally beginning! Today is my first casting! Oh boy, I hope it runs smoothly. Now I just have to change my clothes. I heard that Jenny Sinclair is here too. She's bound to get the main role, as her billionaire dad is too influential for her to not to. Ugh, you mean Jenny? The talentless eye candy? She's nothing special. Her dad's loaded! And it's rumored her mom is a famous actress. But after giving birth to her, she abandoned her for a movie role. This is so unfair. How are we meant to compete with some rich girl with a paternal sob story? <sighs> yes, I'm Jenny Sinclair, the daughter of billionaire Rod Sinclair, and the rumored daughter of a mysterious famous actress. People think growing up in wealth means my life is super easy. Wrong! My dad refuses to talk to me about my mother, Hence, even I myself don't know who she is, and Dad is also completely against my acting dreams. You see, I definitely needed to win this role on talent. Then, they'd all take me seriously. It's almost my turn. I'm so nervous. The movie's called The Servant, so the main role is for the part of this maid, and Mrs. Sharma, a veteran actress who had just come back from Hollywood, will play the role of the ruthless mistress. Ah. This is it. Fingers crossed I don't forget my lines. Next, Jennifer Sinclair. Ignoring the buzzing gossip behind me, I confidently stepped onto the stage and smiled at Mrs. Sharma. She seemed a little surprised when she saw me. Fetch me a cup of chamomile tea. I was walking with the tray when, oops, I tripped and fell, and the cup shattered across the floor. You incompetent girl. You do realize that cup was worth more than you are? Huh? This wasn't in the script. Stunned, I just stood there with a confused look on my face. Poof! Miss Sinclair, how are you supposed to be an actress when your reactions are this abysmal? Acting is also about improvisation, not just learning the script by heart, young lady. Jenny, you clearly didn't do your research, as you're clueless about this character. I regained my composure, hurriedly apologized to Miss Sharma, and begged the director to let me try one more time. I don't have time for this. How can a young girl who was born with a silver spoon in her mouth ever understand the life of a maid? Please leave. Other contestants are waiting. So, my dream casting became a nightmare. Ugh, it felt like the whole world was laughing at me. Miss, please get up. You need to eat something. Please don't be down. There'll be plenty of other opportunities. No, that was my big chance and I blew it. Lucas Hemingworth hates me. That basically means the whole industry will now shun me. Oh, him. My aunt's his housekeeper and she said he's a horror to work for. He's fired five housekeepers within the last month. And now nobody dares apply. Don't let him get you down. Everybody knows how obnoxious he is. Did you just say Lucas Hemingworth is looking for a maid and you know the housekeeper there? Um, that's right, but this is the perfect way to show him that I'm not just a pretty face. I might seem like a spoiled rich girl. I sure still can play the role of a maid better than anyone else. Please help me, or else I'll go on a hunger strike. I... I... Before she had a chance to reply, I grabbed the glass of milk and glugged it all in one breath. Okay then, we have the deal now? Hey, it's me, Jenny. I pass for a maid now, right? Remember what I told you, and never set foot in the master's working room without being asked. Now go to the warehouse and get me the box of Christmas decorations. Ugh, this box was so heavy. Suddenly I bumped into something, and as I fell, all of the Christmas decorations scattered across the floor. Huh? What was beneath me? Oh no, I was lying on top of someone. 
Oh my god. It was Lucas! I quickly got off him and apologized, but he just tutted at me then walked off. I was feeling dumbfounded as I picked up the decorations when this girl approached me. You're the new mate, huh? Don't think that being pretty means you can seduce my dad to become a famous actress or something. Here's a piece of advice. Don't even dream about it. From now on, this maid serves me and only me. What a bummer. It was only my first day and I'd already got on the wrong side of Lily, the director's daughter. She already had a reputation in the modeling world for her extremely unpleasant personality. And indeed, from that day on, whenever she was home, she spent every second of her time tormenting me. Once, Lily asked me to bring her a cup of hot tea, but as soon as I put the tea tray down, she immediately changed her mind. She wanted her tea to be cool instead, so I had to stand fanning the cup for half an hour. Then on another occasion, she ordered me to stand by the pool in the midday heat holding a tray of fruit. Then after each lap, she made me feed her a piece. It's not surprising I ended up with heat stroke and fell into the pool, which must have been extremely funny to Lily. Ugh. Well, she who laughs today may weep tomorrow. The next day, while watering the roses in the backyard, I caught sight of Lily acting out the part of the maid in front of her father through the living room's window. It seemed that she wanted to take the lead role in the movie too. I think you should just focus on your commercial advertising projects. You haven't learned the lines, and your fake crying is terrible. Do you even know which book this movie is adapted from? Then he just left, leaving her with her tantrum. At that moment, Lily caught me standing there laughing. So, as punishment, she ordered me to clean every single book in the library. Ugh! Whatever. I liked books anyway. Standing on the ladder cleaning, I happened to see the original copy of The Servant, the book the play is based on. I took it off the shelf, when suddenly, the sound of the door opening startled me. I quickly put the book back and tried to climb down the ladder, but then I misplaced my footing and... Ah! Firm hands grabbed my waist and guided me onto my feet. They were wearing a hoodie, mask, and sunglasses. OMG, had a thief just saved me? Who are you? How did you get in? This is trespassing. Do you realize whose house you're trying to rob? And you, do you know who you're talking to? Thief, ridiculous. Then he pulled down his hood and took off his sunglasses and mask. Oh God, it was Jack Jerome, the hottest actor on the scene right now. Before I could react, Lily's high-pitched scream startled us both. Jack, you're here! It's so exciting that you're staying with us for the next few months. I'm such a huge fan. To Lily's dismay, Jack ignored her, then coldly walked out of the room. So, turns out Jack's been cast as the male lead in The Servant, and to avoid adding to his already scandalous past and thus affecting the movie, Lucas insisted he stay here during filming. Anyway, even though I didn't like Jack at all, at least him being around meant Lily was too busy clinging on to him to pester me. These days, I often take advantage of the late night cleaning time to study the original book. The last audition is coming up, and I have to understand my character better than anyone else. I was cleaning the kitchen while reading, when suddenly I heard footsteps. Hmm, who could it be at this time? So, you like this book? It's confusing though, right? Are you suggesting a mere maid like me isn't smart enough to understand it? I have no idea why you're cast as the warm, kind-natured, sincere part of Alfred. You're clearly the opposite of him. It's called acting, sweetheart. So are you saying an actor must be exactly like their character in real life? Then shouldn't you be more cautious, since I just played a murdering lunatic in my last movie? He's really unpleasant. Arguing with someone as arrogant as him was pointless. I'd just taken a few steps when I slipped over, but Jack reached out and grabbed my shirt tail, which helped save me from falling flat on the ground. It caused my shirt to tear. I blushed in embarrassment and tried to fix it. Here, have this, he said, as he quickly took off his jacket and placed it around my shoulders. At that moment, out of nowhere, Lily appeared. On seeing her, Jack hurriedly left the kitchen. She stormed over to me and yanked his shirt off me. 
What now? Changing your target already? But let me remind you, you're just some dumb maid. Jack's mine? Oh, poor Lily. You delusional girl. I'm not interested in Jack. But it doesn't take more than a glance to tell he's not remotely interested in her. Because of yesterday's incident, Lily made me wake up at 4 a.m. to bake probably all kinds of cakes that exist on Earth. I'd just finished decorating the last batch when she rushed into the kitchen, snatched the apron and gloves off me, then put them on. I didn't have time to understand what was happening when Jack walked in and she quickly held the plate out to him. Have a bite! I got up early to make it for you. What a fake! Jack was about to pop a piece of cake into his mouth when I realized it was almond. He's allergic to them. Stop! That cake has almonds in it. Here, have this one. He took the cake, then winked at me before he walked off. Yeah, his personality sucks, but... Oh boy, how to resist that strong jawline and those beautiful deep eyes? Mm. Naturally, Lily was furious, so she forced me to make tea. But no matter how much she knocked on Jack's door... He wouldn't open it for her, so she angrily threw the tea tray on the ground and yelled for me to clean it up. Oh my, it was such a mess. The carpet was tea-stained and there were bits of chipped china everywhere. I started picking up the pieces when, ouch, he cut my hand. Jack immediately opened the door. Then on seeing my bleeding hand, he quickly led me into his room and helped me bandage the cut. I didn't know he had this warm side to him. How surprising. This weekend, the director's having a small gathering for the film cast and crew, so my time was taken up with the preparation for this. Now I was confident to say that I had fully understood what it's like to be a servant, there's no housework that I hadn't tried. I also accidentally lied to the housekeeper that I used to be a bartender, so she assigned the cocktail making to me. I was trying to get my head around the recipe of a cosmopolitan when Jack walked in. Pretty good, but perhaps it needs a little more cranberry juice. You want the merry, not passing out. <laughs> I know all the guests coming, so I can give you hints on what cocktails to serve them. That's a good thing. I could ask him more about my future co-stars. The two of us talked passionately about wine, cocktails, and the servant book. Hmm, turns out he's actually quite sweet, and nothing at all like those ego-driven swine the press portray him as. While talking and drinking, I felt a little dizzy. Suddenly, Jack approached me. Actually, I find you quite captivating, so you can quit playing around now. Playing around? Huh? You think I like you? You're drunk. I was about to leave when Jack stopped me. You're always falling over in front of me. You remember my almond allergy. You're reading the book I'm cast as the lead in. If you don't like me... How come you've been with me this whole time? I looked at Jack confused. Honestly, every time I faced him, I felt my heart skip. Seeing me blushing, Jack gently lifted my chin and placed a sweet kiss on my lips. Right then, a scream made me jump and almost fell over again. Ah! What on earth are you two doing? I frantically ran out of the kitchen leaving Lily screaming behind me. I sat outside by the pool until I regained my composure. That was unexpected. My first kiss was with Jack, the scandalous actor I hated the most. Hmm, I think I needed to leave before things became even more complicated. After composing myself, I went back to my room to start packing. I saw my clothes were thrown across the ground and... There, sitting on my bed with a smug look on her face, was Lily. She waved my passport and script in her hand. Jenny Sinclair, it appears I know your secret. How humble of you to lower yourself to play a maid just to get a movie role. Imagine the scandal if the press found out about this. No one would dare to cooperate with a snake like you. I angrily grabbed my things back, but it didn't work. Lily even pulled out her phone to film and threaten me. Do what I say, else this video goes viral. Then not only will your daddy dearest know you've been scrubbing toilets all day, but imagine the damage your lies will do to his precious reputation. Ugh. She was messing with the wrong girl. 
My method acting experience was over. I was done being her puppet. It's time she realized who's the true master of this game. I entered the apartment to see four sets of eyes gawping at me. Hang on, I know Ned and Philip from my math class, and the girl currently giving me a snooty look while twirling her hair around her finger was Jessica. Well, I didn't actually know her, but her wealthy and snobbish reputation preceded her. Then lastly was that emo kid. What was his name again? Deciding to break the uncomfortable silence, I said, Oh, hey, so guess you guys are also in detention? No one replied, though they surely heard me. Whoa, okay. This atmosphere was tense, and I thought I'd always been the awkward one. Honestly, I don't even know why I'm being made to do this weird detention. All I did was accidentally and poorly throw the dodgeball in the gym teacher's face. Then when I was about to apologize, my tongue slipped. But, but, aren't you supposed to be the toughest since you're the gym teacher? I mumbled. Naturally, she was livid. So I ended up in the principal's office, and he handed me a piece of paper with an apartment address on it and said, Go here for your detention. You'll stay here until you've learned your lesson. Huh? What type of unspecific instructions were those? Before I could ask him any more, he shooed me out of his office. Now, here I am in this random apartment with these untalkative kids. As I looked at them, I couldn't help but wonder what they'd done to end up here, especially when Ned was an excellent student. Did he make the wrong move in the chess club or something? <laughs> we continued the whole staring at each other in silence routine. But then the door burst open and stormed in Gwen. Our school's resident carefree tomboy, she sneered out. Good evening, babies. Great. Now I was stuck sharing a living space with a girl renowned for playing pranks such as toilet papering the principal's car and filling the biology lab with live frogs. But seriously, how were we at her truancy level? Let's see who we have here. Gwen rubbed her hands as she walked around and stared at us. Princess Jessica? Oof, how come? She raised an eyebrow and grinned sarcastically. Just sit down and shut up. Gwen gave him a dirty look. This isn't basketball. You're not the captain here, jock. Then she squared up to him. Ned turned pale. Jessica rolled her eyes, and the emo boy, well, he was busy sketching something and clearly chose to ignore our existence. We'd only been here for less than an hour, and the last thing we needed was a fist fight, so I stepped in between them. Pulling a wry face, Gwen said, What's this? Little Miss Friendly? Look, we're all stuck here and we don't know for how long, so let's at least try to be civil. Let's try talking it out. So, I'm Ashley, and I'm here because of a misunderstanding with a gym teacher and a dodgeball. Jeez, nobody cares! I can't believe I have to be here with these people. Jessica stood up and left. Pfft, I'm with Miss Popular on this one. Ned sneered before he also left. And the emo boy too. Then Gwen rasped and disappeared. There was only Philip and me left in the room. Hmm, he was meant to be handsome and stuff. But looking at him now, I didn't think so. Ugh. This awkward silence was insufferable. This was just like that movie, The Breakfast Club, but much worse, and in much longer time. <sighs> Who on earth had to pack clothes for detention? I had no idea how long I had to stay here for. So I decided to go to bed. I walked into the girls' room to see that both of the beds next to the window were already occupied. Bummer, they'd taken the best spots. I reluctantly got into the only bed left and hoped that tomorrow wouldn't suck as much as today had. The next morning, I woke up to yelling. Huh? I rubbed my eyes and yawned. It was still far too early. I went out into the corridor to see what was going on and saw Jessica and Ned arguing over the apartment's only bathroom. 
Jessica wanted to apply her makeup while Ned really needed to go. Then Philip watched on and butted in on occasion to say something dumb. Why don't you use some of your nerdy mathematics to solve your problem? The only reason you need to spend so long applying makeup is because you're ugly. Ooh, burn! Philip laughed. Suddenly, the bathroom door slammed shut. They rushed over to it and tried opening it to no avail. Ten minutes later, the emo kid stepped out. Jessica screamed at him. How dare you! My personal stuff is still in there! I watched on, wide-eyed. OMG! These people were ridiculous! How was I meant to live with them? In the end, we eventually came to an agreement about the bathroom's rule. It was first come, first serve, but each of us could only have the throne for a max 15 minutes. Being in such a small space with people I barely knew was always going to be problematic, but not having our phones as a distraction made it so much harder. We had one TV, but there's only one lousy channel on it. No one cleaned up. No one seemed to get along. Ugh, seriously? When will this end? All of the constant dirt and arguing was driving me nuts. But then the final straw was this one time when I was washing my face, the cleansing foam accidentally got into my eyes to wipe it out. But to my horror, when I opened my eyes, so I quickly reached for a towel, I saw myself holding someone's sock instead. Yuck! After that, I gathered everyone and threw the sock onto the floor and said, We need to sort out order, as I can't live like this anymore. It's gross. Jessica snorted. Who are you to boss around? No one cares what you think. Before I even had a chance to say anything back, Ned piped in that Jessica was just a dumb rich girl who never lifted a finger. Then Gwen jumped up to her feet and started shouting for no reason. Philip gave me this smirky know-it-all look that made me want to scream. Then he actually lobbed a basketball at me, which almost took my head off. Then, ignoring the others, I started shouting at him. The only one who stayed quiet was the emo boy. You weren't even that pretty. In fact, I've seen more attractive slugs. I heard Ned say to Jessica, Hmm, that was a bit much, wasn't it? I mean, it was obvious Ned only teases Jessica because he has a huge crush on her. Jessica huffed as she tossed her hair behind her back, then stormed off to her room. Man, this place sucks. At least lunchtime had arrived. So I made myself a delicious-looking burger, then quickly went to the bathroom. When I returned, I couldn't believe it. Philip was taking a bite out of my burger. I screamed at him, but then he shrugged, then said he'd make me a new one. And like a decade later, my replacement lunch finally arrived, and Philip was smiling at me strangely and watched on as I bit into it. Ew! I lifted up the top of the bun to see a raw piece of beetroot. Ugh. I was so fed up with everyone that I went to bed super early that night. Only, when I woke up the next day... Both Jessica and Gwen burst out laughing at me. I hurried to the bathroom and checked out my face. Oh no. Turns out someone had drawn on my pillow, and now I had ink all over my face. I had to scrub my face for ages to get it off. Then Philip wouldn't quit laughing at me. I knew he was responsible. Ugh! Such a jerk! And on the other hand... We also had the emo kid that I was seriously getting sick of. He never said or did anything. Instead, he just sat there, usually wearing his stompy boots and looking all moody. I mean, why wear those sweaty-looking boots when he's stuck inside? It was about time he spoke up, so I came up with a prank to get him talking. When the emo kid was in the shower, Ned and I filled his beloved boots with mayo. A little later, I heard some loud thump. Then the emo kid did a weird walk across the room with his foot covered in mayo while clutching one of his boots. Have you lost your mind? He shouted. And not gonna lie, I was intimidated by this other side of him. Then out of nowhere, Jessica appeared. She turned to me and shoved my shoulder. That was too much, don't you think? Oh no, you didn't. I wasn't gonna let someone like her speak to me like that and get away with it. 
so I struck a defensive pose and glared at her. We ended up in a stare-off when suddenly I felt arms pulling me back. It was Philip. I tried flailing free of his grip, which caused him to lose his balance, and he accidentally elbowed Gwen. Oh, you're done, Jock! Soon, Jessica and I were pulling each other's hair, and Gwen and Philip were shoving each other. It was mayhem! Stop! All of you! It was the emo kid. He glared at us with rage. You're acting like immature brats! Well, that was unexpected. But I guess it worked. As a few seconds later, we started cleaning up the mess we'd made. We knew something needed to change, so at dinner, we all sat around the table and tried to sort things out. The others were all staring down at their food and not talking, so I decided to go first. So, I'm here because I don't always react well to certain situations. I don't know, I guess I find it hard to make friends. I trailed off. Then Ned spoke up. The only word my mom seems to know nowadays is study, study, study. I feel like all I am to her is a grade. So when I got a B in English lit, I ripped it up in front of the teacher. That's the story. Jessica flicked back her hair then said, Try having all the money you could ever want, but the most neglectful parents ever. I bet they still haven't noticed that I've been stuck here with you losers for days now just because I told some girl her skirt was hideous. I was doing her a favor. Poof. Then Philip blurted out, My father wanted me to be strong and manly just like him. I don't want to be like him, but I'm worried I will be, and that I won't be able to do anything about it. So I skipped basketball practice, got into an argument with the coach and my dad, and now I'm in the weirdest detention ever. Gwen sneered. At least your dad's around. Mine does month-long disappearing acts. And my mom's dead. Oh, and I'm here because I put paint in some clown's locker. Serves them right for badmouthing me. Her words were followed by an intense silence. Awkward. But I felt like I understood everyone a little better now. Oh, but hang on. The emo kid hadn't said anything. Hey, you. I looked at him. So, what's your story? He shrugged. And I didn't think he was going to talk, but then in a quiet voice he said, I'm Stan. I never knew my dad. My mom isn't around, so I live with my grandparents. I'm here because I ignored the principal, but only because I had earphones in. Oh, I muttered out. Look, I'm sorry about your boots. I'll help you clean them if you like. Stan nodded. Jessica was right. I had been a bit harsh on him. Then Ned gave this awkward smile and said, Um, Jessica, I know I've been a jerk to you, but it's only because I, um, I like you. Jessica didn't do so much as flinch. She still kept studying her nails. Probably because having boys smitten over her was already a part of her daily routine. Well, I might like someone too. Phil stretched his arms behind his chair. I guess I like winding her up. He looked directly at me. I felt myself blushing, and I had this weird fluttering feeling in my stomach. But why? My heart started racing. Now what was I meant to do? What a beautiful day! Guess who just landed the lead role in the musical club's next play? Yep, me! As I immersed myself in the rhythm of the music, Ouch! I bumped into someone and fell over. Uh, are you blind? You think you're so special you can just waltz around the places you please? Not again. Why do I keep running into her? That's Kiera, the mean girl from my musical club. I sing, she dances, I always make sure to stay in my lane, but for some reason, Kiera won't stop criticizing me. Ugh, please, you sound like a screeching cat. Give me fingernails on a chalkboard over your squawking any day. Why she gotta be so mean? Huh? What's this? Oh, a wallet. Someone must have dropped it. But I'm the only person in this alley. There must be an ID card or something in it, right? So I opened the wallet to check it, but nope. No student card, no ID. Instead, there's just a strange photo and a bunch of VIP membership cards. 
with the name Sophia on them. Ooh, these places are swanky. This person must be super wealthy. I gotta hand this into the cop station. But wait, isn't this... Oh my god, a ticket to see Franz Ferdinand tonight! I love that band! And it's for the VIP area! Hmm, even if I bring this to the cops now, they still won't be able to find the owner before the concert anyway. We shouldn't let such an awesome ticket go to waste, right? So, what if... I'll enjoy tonight's concert on this girl's behalf, then I'll hand the wallet to the cops later. Honest! Wow, this is the biggest stage I've ever seen in my life! I got to my seat and eagerly waited for the show to start when I heard a voice next to me. Hey, you must be Sophia. My gosh, this guy was gorgeous! But he'd mistaken me for someone else. Wait a minute. That's right. Sophia was the name on the cards. The wallet's owner. I was still looking for a way to explain this awkward situation when he continued. Glad to meet you. I'm Roman, and I've heard a lot about you from my parents. They're kind of good at arranging things, aren't they? Because I really admire this band. I should have foreseen this happening. I mean, who goes to a concert alone? Luckily for me, it appears that this Roman guy had never met the real Sophia before. For one night only, I could pretend to be her, right? And guess what? The guy was not only super cute, but also a talented musician. He'd spent most of his life in Italy and had not long returned to the US to attend college here. Through him, I learned that Sophia was a gifted singer, and both their parents set this meeting up so that Roman could help her singing career. Talking to Roman felt so natural, and soon I was singing and swaying to the music alongside him. As soon as I arrived home, I immediately went online to find more information about Roman. Wow! His SoundCloud account has over 200,000 subscribers! <sighs> Handsome and talented, he's like a James Dean of modern times. As I was daydreaming, my phone vibrated. He texted me. I had a great time tonight. I'm having a small welcome home party at the Madison Club. I heard you go there often. If you're not busy, would you like to join us? The Madison Club? As in, one of the most expensive country clubs in the state? The initiation fee alone costs a thousand dollars, and this girl is a frequent flyer? And, yup, here's the Madison Club VIP membership card. I know, I know. But I still had loads of music-related questions to ask Roman. Just this once. Then I would definitely hand it in. Now, on to the next problem. I couldn't wear these mediocre outfits to the Madison Club. I needed something demure, but expensive-looking. Hmm, if I was Sophia, where would I shop? Yes, the Crystal Lane Mall! The next morning, I strolled up to the exclusive shopping mall with all of my savings. But how can a dress this short cost $5,000? Are there actually people who are willing to pay that much for this tiny fabric? The only item I could afford was a sparkly hairpin. So be it. I gritted my teeth, taking the hairpin to the checkout counter, along with all the cash I had on me and the membership card. But surprisingly, not only did I get the hairpin for free, but they also gifted me this cute bag. Apparently, it was my birthday. Well, Sophia's birthday, to be exact. Honestly, I felt kind of guilty enjoying these services in Sophia's name. But I didn't spend any of her money. Seeing as this bag's a freebie, I get to keep it, right? The next day, I settled on a simple but pretty dress and my beautiful new bag and wore them to school, as I planned to go straight from there to the party. When my best friend Anna came over to me, she took one look at my bag, then <gasps> gaped in disbelief. A Chanel bag? Did you sell a kidney to buy it? <laughs> it was a gift. Uh, where did you get that? That's a limited edition for VIP members of the Crystal Lane Mall only. Spill it. It's a fake, yeah? Kiera and her unruly friends were at it again. I tried to pull Anna away as I didn't want any trouble, but she still managed to clap back at them. It's 100% authentic! Maisie's rich boyfriend got it for her! Jealous much? Kiera sneered, then said unless I called my boyfriend over, she would tell the whole school that we were tragic liars. Come on, Maisie! Show them what humiliation feels like! Oh no! What should I do? Thanks to Anna's expectant looks and Kiera's smug grin, I had no choice but to ask Roman to pick me up after school. Um, he says he'll come get me after class. As soon as I stepped out of the school gate, I saw Roman waiting next to a shiny Bugatti Chiron. 
He greeted me with a smile, then opened the door for me. I didn't need to turn around to know that Kiera was watching me with fiery eyes. After this, she wouldn't dare to look down on me again, right? Ooh, this place was even more lavish than I imagined. As we were early, Roman invited me to sing a song while he played the piano. I started singing, and he too joined in to harmonize, and this moment felt just great. How cool was it seeing him all immersed in music? By the time we finished our performance, I realized a crowd had gathered around us, and they all burst into wild applause. An angelic voice and a genius musician. What a perfect couple. I turned to Roman and saw him smiling fondly at me. Wow, I knew my parents said you were good, but I had no idea you'd be that incredible. Feeling my face heating up, I quickly excused myself, then ran to the bathroom. Well, once I could find it, to calm down. Yeah, so this was a confusing mess, but it didn't change the fact that my heart was still thudding like crazy. This experience was like daydreaming, but maybe I should tell him the truth before things went too far. I returned to see Roman talking with a girl. Seeing me coming, Roman waved me over and said, Here she is. Hey, Sophia. I've just been chatting with your little sister. Oh no, I was going to tell Roman the truth myself, but... When the girl turned around and, isn't that, Kiera? So Kiera is my, I mean, Sophia's sister? Kiera seemed as surprised as I was, as she made up an excuse and left. Huh, did she really just leave without making a scene? The next day, I turned up at school with the wallet and looked for Kiera, only I couldn't find her anywhere. When the last bell rang, I received a message from her that said, meet me in the alley behind school. I nervously arrived at the rendezvous spot and saw Kiera waiting there. Here's your sister's wallet. Sorry I didn't return it sooner. But to my surprise, she didn't even take the wallet. Thief, you'll pay for that. What did she mean by that? Let me be clear, I didn't steal this. I just picked it up by accident. I was always going to hand it in. Then why did you use my sister's name and membership cards? I just, no more excuses, stealing is still stealing. If you don't want everyone, including Roman, to know that you're an identity thief, you'd better do what I say. You will sing for me to lip sync at the city's upcoming singing contest. Singing contest? But Kiera's a dancer, not a singer. Suddenly, a voice from behind startled me. Here you are, Sophia. I've been looking for you. I turned and saw Roman's happy, oh so cute face. He'd be so gutted when he found out that I'd lied to him from the start, sensing my feelings. Kiera just smirked at me before she left. Remember our deal, sister? It turned out that Roman had just finished composing a new song that day and wanted me to record a demo for it at his studio. But this isn't right. I hesitated, then blurted out, Roman, actually I'm not. Roman interrupted before I could finish my sentence and showed me the poster of an upcoming singing contest. Oh, it was the one Kiera mentioned earlier. You should give it a try. It's a good opportunity. I shook my head sadly, but I can't. Why? How can I tell Roman that I can't participate in the contest because I have to help Kiera lip sync? So I just told him some baloney about having a family thing on that day. When I got home, I decided there's only one thing for it. I had to block Roman. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but I had to stop this web of lies now before they overtook my life. On the day of the singing contest, Although I'd pre-recorded the song for Kiera, she still dragged me along with her. Hmm, that's odd. She didn't seem her usual brash self. Maybe the nerves had got to her? Then, midway through her performance, she misjudged a move and her mic clattered to the floor. As she was standing there dumbfounded, my voice continued to blast out. The whole room fell silent. Then slowly, the murmurs began to rise. Everyone pointed and commented on Kiera, and I heard the man sitting next to me muttering, She's brought more shame on our family. How could I tell anyone that's my daughter? Oh, so this is Kiera's father? And the woman sitting next to him, probably her mother, was also shaking her head in boredom. At that moment, a staff member approached them to say something, and I could see their faces turn pale before they rushed out of the auditorium. Seeing that, Kiera burst into tears, then rushed off the stage. Jeez, how can parents treat their child like that? Kiera may have been a mean girl, but she didn't deserve that. 
I was about to go check if she was okay when a hand pulled me back. It was Roman. Maisie, it's your turn. Right at that moment, the host of the show called me to the stage by my real name. Huh? What was going on? I turned to look at Roman, but grinning, he just wished me luck and handed me the mic. And the music started. It was the song that Roman and I had sung together. I took a deep breath to calm myself, then sang my heart out. When I ended the performance, all three judges stood up to applaud, and the audience cheered me on. Oh dear, am I dreaming? What is all this? Do you know who I really am? Yeah, of course. I figured that out ages ago. Turns out me not knowing where the restrooms were in the country club gave the game away. <laughs> so he did his research and found out that I wasn't actually Sophia. Only because he still wanted to see me, he pretended not to know so we could carry on like normal. He also accidentally witnessed Kiera making me sing for her performance, so he decided to register me. Talking about Kiera, I wanted to make sure she was okay. We searched around and found her sitting outside, sobbing. It's okay, there will be other competitions. I'm not upset about that. It's my sister, she's missing. Through tears, Kiera told us about how from a young age, her parents wanted her and her sister to pursue a career in music. However, Kiera found a love of dance while Sophia excelled at singing making her favorable to their parents. Regardless of how many dance contests Kiera won, they always overlooked her talent. Then, when she excitedly told them that she'd bagged the lead dance role in the school play, they just went on about Sophia instead. So, feeling disheartened and jealous, Kiera threw away her sister's wallet, the one that I accidentally picked up that day. In this singing contest, Kiera wanted to win against her sister in front of their parents for once, so she got me into this whole lip-syncing plan of hers. But last night, Sophia found out about it, and they had an argument. Then, in anger, Kiera blurted out nasty things, such as how she longed for Sophia to vanish from her life. Only that morning, she woke up and found that her sister had actually gone. Until now, Sophia still hadn't even shown up at the auditorium when it's soon going to be her turn to perform. What if Sophia never comes back? I shouldn't have been so mean. Roman and I comforted Kiera. Then we went to find Sophia together. Kiera took us to Sophia's fave places, but she was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly, I remembered the picture carefully inserted inside her wallet. This must be a special place for her. This is my family's old house. We used to live here when I was little. We rushed over there and found Sophia sitting idly in front of the house. The two of them ran into each other's arms and sobbed like two children. Through tears, they talked it all out. Turns out, while Kiera was jealous of her sister, Sophia didn't have it any better either. She has been pressured by their parents' expectations since forever, and she did always feel sorry for Kiera because of all the privileges she had. You know, you can't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. If singing is your passion, feel free to live it to the fullest. But if it's not, don't be afraid to pursue what makes you happy. I mean, you're actually a really awesome dancer. So, in the end, Sophia and Kiera made up. After a big fight with their parents, the two sisters were free to pursue their own passion. Kiera focused on dancing, while Sophia and her friends formed an indie band like she always wanted. As for me, well, I've learned a lesson that if you find a lost item, take it to the cop station immediately. Luckily for me, it hasn't turned out so bad. I helped two sisters find peace, and even got myself this handsome, super talented musician. This school is so boring. All they do is talk nonsense and do nonsense things. Worse still, I feel like I can never escape them, as some of them live in the same neighborhood as me. But you know what the most annoying thing about my life is? That's Joy, my identical twin sister. In my parents' eyes, she's perfect. That's why she's the favorite child. Her allowance is more than mine and she gets to attend an elite private school while I'm stuck at the most boring school ever. How unfair! With a sulky face, I walked into my room whining. 
I think having identical daughters means our parents forgot that there's actually two of us. They've never picked me up from school. Don't be absurd. They just took me to collect my dress for the school gala. <laughs> a new dress for some fancy party. How terrible for you. I don't even want to go to the party. Trust a nerd like you not to appreciate what you have. If I were you, I'd make the most of every second of that elite school of yours. And if I were you, I would just enjoy my pressure-free life. We both <sighs> sighed and stared into a void thinking about our tiring lives. Then Joy suddenly turned to me. Oh my god, Jade! Do you want to be me? Go to my school, have my things, and attend the gala? What a brilliant idea! Why had we never thought of it before? I'd live her fancy life and she'd live my doll one. That's perfect! Wow, this school is enormous. I tried to keep my cool as I navigated the endless hallways in search of Joy's locker. Ah, found it. I spotted a group of girls waving me over. They must be Joy's besties. Ruth, Nora, and Nell. Unlike my boring sister, they looked very glam in their branded clothes. What a power group. Wherever we went, all eyes were on us. Students handed us snacks, saved places in the cafeteria line for us, and let us sit in the front row of the basketball match. These girls were so interesting. Bet I fit in with them way more than Joy did. Talking about Joy, she somehow loved my boring old-fashioned school. I'd never heard her chat that much in my life. About how nice my friends were, how easy all the lessons were, and how cool the school bus was. Joy's friends were so much fun, and they did cool things. For instance, they always had shopping dates and bought each other expensive gifts without question. One time, Nora, the richest girl in the group, didn't hesitate in going into Kate Spade and buying the new release handbag for Ruth. I thought this was pretty awesome of Nora, but then something happened that made me question the group dynamics. Ruth told me that she liked the red velvet cupcakes at the bakery near my house, and she asked me to buy her some. I was happy to do it, but the next day, when I brought the cupcakes and told her the price, she burst out laughing. <laughs> Joy, my dear, I don't care how much they cost. That's your concern. Then she turned to Nora, showed her a picture of a cute but expensive skirt, and told her to order it for her. Hang on, had she always been thinking it was acceptable to order us around like this? I don't understand why an innocent bookworm like my sister would hang around with this cunning clique. They don't study at all. During the test, while I was still randomly circling the answer, Ruth kept on kicking my chair and urging me to let her copy my work. And as soon as the teacher turned her back on us, she even snatched my answer sheet. Huh? What's with that attitude? I took a look around and saw both Nora and Nell were also copying another girl's paper against her will. Rude! After the test, Ruth came up to me, hissing. Have you forgotten our deal? Huh? Deal? What could it be? Well, I guess I would have to put up with Ruth for as long as I was Joy, so I could return everything to her in roughly the same condition after the gala. What I really should do now is just to enjoy this elite school life, right? So, I didn't join Ruth and her minions for lunch, but bought food from this super cool vending machine instead. They even had pizza! But, the machine made these weird sounds. Ugh, I think my food was stuck. So I kicked and tapped it. But it still didn't work! <laughs> you dare get into an altercation with the pizza machine? You must be starving. Oh. My. God. This basketball boy was the most handsome guy I'd ever seen in my life. I was too lost in his eyes to realize the dumb machine had finally delivered my lunch. This gorgeous guy then leaned towards me and my heart skipped. Oh Cupid, I wish I was the one he picked up instead of the pizza. Here you go. Right before I could react, someone snatched the tray and pushed me aside to enter between us. Thanks Hayden, wanna share lunch with me? Huh, <laughs> excuse me? How could she steal both pizza and a boy from me? The boy took my pizza from her and said, Thanks, but I'd like to share this with this cute starving girl instead. I'll buy the drinks. Wait, was he asking me? Then yes, 100% yes! Leaving a furious Ruth behind us, we walked to the bench table nearby. So, he's Hayden, the captain of the basketball team. We talked so much about our favorite comic books and even played basketball for a bit before classes. That was my best lunch ever.
After school, I was about to leave when Ruth stopped me. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to mingle with Hayden? He's not wealthy. We have high standards about who deserves to be around us. Duh! Huh? She sure seemed to swoon over him earlier, but now that he'd turned her down, she decided he wasn't worthy? This girl's mindset really didn't sit well with me. As soon as I arrived home, I told Joy everything. You should listen to Ruth. Hayden must be bad news. I don't care what Ruth thinks. How come you do? Is it because of this deal you have with her? <sighs> Not your business, but stay away from Hayden. I don't want to get in trouble. Ugh, this vague hints were agitating me. What was it about? But whatever the deal between Joy and Ruth was, I wasn't going to let it get in the way of my blossoming romance with Hayden. Today, me and Hayden had arranged to meet at lunch again to play basketball. I excitedly walked out of art class just as the girl fell and dropped her painting set around my feet. I immediately picked them up for her, when all of a sudden, a boy's hand covered mine right before someone stamped their feet on our hands. It was Ruth! It was her who tripped up the poor girl too. She did all that on purpose to hurt me, but Hayden got there just in time to save the day. What do you think you're doing? Feeling too embarrassed being caught red-handed, Ruth couldn't do anything but give me a spiteful look before leaving. I couldn't believe that Hayden did that for me. His hand was swollen but he just kept checking if my hand was okay. How can Ruth be so horrible? Because she knows everyone's ugly secrets and she uses them to control people. Joy, she knows your secret too, right? No. Uh, um... I'm not sure, but I don't care. No matter what that secret is, she's gone too far. Don't worry, I got your back. So will I. Oh, I'm Katie, by the way. From then on, I no longer hung out with Ruth and her minions. But I kept quiet about this to Joy as I didn't want her freaking out and making us switch back places early. The more time I spent with Hayden, the more I found myself liking him. I wanted to confess to him who I really am, but I can't. At least not yet anyway. <sighs> Katie is really nice to me too, and she introduced me to her super sweet friends. Everything was just perfect, except my grades. Well, I didn't dare to tell Joy about this either. My study was pretty bad, and it literally ruined Joy's straight A record. Meanwhile, Ruth, time after time, insisted that I was the one who had to do all her homework, research, and tests. But duh, I couldn't even finish mine. You know what I've got. Yeah? What exactly is that you have? What's all the threat about? Ruth was stunned seeing me talking back at her like that. Yep, that was it. I've had enough. After class, she waited at my locker and signaled me to follow her to the equipment room. Finally, I can know what my secret was. Ruth showed me a video on her phone of Joy sneakily checking her notes during an examination. Was she <gasps> cheating? If our principal sees this, I'm sure your precious scholarship will be long gone. And what about that excellent student title of yours? So Ruth was using this to manipulate Joy. Does she do the same to everyone else? Do you think this would scare me? I don't think. I know. You don't want to lose everything, right? <laughs> no, Ruth. It's you who's gonna lose. Do whatever you want with that clip, like I care. And so, I walked away, leaving a fuming Ruth behind. To be honest, I was a bit scared. Well, I know scores and things like academic transcripts were so important to Joy. What if I destroyed it all? After my last class of the day, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. The principal called me to her office and showed me the video that proved that I cheated on a math exam. She was so disappointed in my horrible grades recently, she even asked if it was because I was too caught up in my dating life and the bad influence I called friends. But how am I supposed to tell her that it was just my own incompetence? Nothing to do with Joy or Hayden or my new friends. I just reached my room door when I heard mom scolding Joy. The principal must have called her. It was all my fault. When mom left the room, I could feel how angry and frustrated mom was. Joy, I'm so sorry. I couldn't let Ruth have this hold over me. Um, I mean you anymore. I waited for Joy to take it out on me. But to my surprise, she was kind of happy. <gasps> That's okay. I think I should thank you for that. I've never been brave enough to stand up for myself, although I was so tired of getting picked on all the time. I was so scared, but turns out being scolded by mom isn't as bad as I thought. <laughs>
My homeroom teacher also called me, but she only gave me a warning and told me not to make the same mistake again. I've never felt this at ease before, Jade. I'm not the perfect Joy anymore. Then, Joy told me about the pressure she felt to be perfect. One time, she even got sick before the math test due to studying too much. Not having enough decent revision and being afraid of getting a bad grade, Joy cheated and was caught and recorded by Ruth as evidence. We finally understood each other and decided to teach Ruth a lesson to stop manipulating and taking advantage of others. We spied on Ruth and secretly recorded her. And guess what? Turned out she was not as wealthy as she always pretended to be. All the brand names she had were from the poor victims that she called friends. I also filmed Ruth forcing the top students to do homework and essays for the rich kids while she just sat idly to collect money. I was so ready to post these <laughs> videos online, but Joy stopped me. She told me if we did this, we were just as bad as Ruth. Instead, she had a better idea. She sent the videos to Ruth and demanded her to delete all of the student's secrets. In exchange, we would delete all of hers. Ruth, of course, had no choice but to obey. Wow, how mature my sister is. My last day in Joy's life has arrived. I'm just gonna make the most of it before I hand the reins back to my sister. Honestly, I kinda miss my normal school and my friends. But what about Hayden? Will he still wanna know me when he finds out I lied to him? I was looking around for Hayden when I saw some mean girls mocking Ruth for wearing a dress cheaper than theirs. So I walked straight up to them and whispered into their ears that I knew all their dirty secrets and they couldn't do anything else but storm off. Ruth gave me a coy look, mumbled a thank you, and then left. At that moment, a warm hand gently clasped mine. Hayden! Wow, you're so cool. I... I'm not that cool, Hayden. Actually, I am... I have something I have to tell you. I then told him everything, from how I swapped identities with my twin sister to how I ruined her school life because of my childishness. You didn't ruin anything. Actually, you made things much better. So, since the pizza vending machine day till now, it has always been you, not Joy, right? Yeah, it's been me all along. <laughs> That's all I needed to know. Then he pulled me in for the best kiss ever. Hi, that's me, Maxine, hiding behind some bushes and spying on a girl. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a crush on her, nor am I a total psychopath. I'm just doing a favor for my mate Damon. But if I'd known how crazy this was all going to get, I'd never have agreed to help him. It all started when Damon fell in love with this girl, Sophie. She had this mysterious charm that made him want to talk to her right away. And he did. She didn't even glance at him. She just walked away. Ouch. I didn't like her one bit. She was so stuck up. But Damon didn't give up that easily. He tried all kinds of tricks to get her attention, even waiting for the bus with her, even though he had a car. Nothing worked, though, and this made him miserable. He begged for my help, but I said, no way. Then he said, oh, come on, Maxine, you're a girl, so just befriend her or something. Maybe you can find out what she likes, her fave foods, music, etc. Then I can try to impress her. Please, I'm begging you. I'll even lend you my Nintendo Switch for a month if you agree. You can't say no to that. He had me at that. I'd do anything to get a Nintendo Switch. Fine, it's a deal. But don't blame me if it doesn't work. So after class that day, I searched for Sophie. She was at the bus stop, and I was about to approach her when suddenly she walked away. I decided to follow her, and on the way, she stopped to help an old lady cross the road. Wow, I was surprised. For someone with such a cold face, she had a pretty warm heart. Hmm, maybe she wasn't so bad after all. After that, she started walking towards the park, and by then it was starting to get dark. What was she doing? She sat down on a bench in a creepy part of the park, almost like she was waiting for someone, I hid behind a bush so she wouldn't see me, but I was totally freaked out. Suddenly, two guys appeared and started talking to her, but they didn't seem like her acquaintances. Oh my gosh, she looked panicked. I had to help. I quickly shouted, Help! Officer! Please help! There are two guys bothering us! 
Obviously, there was no officer, but it worked. The two guys ran off, and I rushed over to make sure Sophie was okay. She was surprised to see me, but then she hugged me and thanked me for saving her. Her whole body was shaking. She must have been terrified. I walked with her back to our dorm, and she told me how she liked to come to the park at night because it was so peaceful. I told her it was clearly dangerous and that she probably shouldn't go alone anymore. Then we exchanged numbers, and after that we became quite close. Close enough. That was a few days later I told her Damon had a big crush on her, and asked if she'd maybe go on a date with him, but she just shook her head and said she wasn't ready. Her eyes looked sad, so I didn't push it any further. Maybe she'd just gone through a bad breakup? I didn't ask her again, but one night I was heading to her dorm for a movie night when I heard two people fighting. It was Sophie and some guy, and she was crying. It looked like the guy was about to hit her, so I ran over and said, Hey, what the heck do you think you're doing? Leave her alone or I'll call the cops. He just laughed at me and said to Sophie, We're not done yet. Then he stormed off. I asked Sophie if she was okay and who that guy was. Then she told me how he was her ex and that he kept trying to get back together with her, but she wasn't interested. As she told me this, she started to cry and said, Because of him, I've become so scared and anxious. I'm even too scared to sleep at night. I felt so sorry for her and told her I was here for her and that she could call me any time. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said that, because that's exactly what she started doing. Every night she'd call me, and we'd end up chatting until 3 a.m. I was so exhausted, but I wanted to help her. She seemed so anxious all the time. Damon knew we chatted a lot, but he'd stopped asking about Sophie. It seems he'd lost interest and was more worried about me looking like a zombie from The Walking Dead. You seriously need some sleep, Maxine. Leave Sophie be. She's clearly got issues. It's probably best to not get too involved. Easier said than done, though. But that night, I decided not to answer her call. I went to bed early, and when I woke up the next morning, I had about 20 missed calls and 50 texts from her. Oh my gosh! Some of them said she was so lonely and that I'd abandoned her. Then one said, if you don't pick up, then I will end it all. Okay, this was crazy. I immediately called her, but she wouldn't pick up. I rushed to her dorm, but nobody answered. I was panicking by then and bashing on the door, screaming, Sophie, open this darn door. But there was still no answer. I was terrified she'd done something bad, so I asked some students to help me bash down the door, and that's when she opened the door. I've never been so happy to see someone alive. I ran over to hug her, but she looked so annoyed. What are you doing here? You're making a scene, she said. What? I was so worried about you. You said you were going to... But she interrupted me and said, You need to get some sleep, Maxine. You seem insane. I couldn't believe it. After all those calls and texts, she was the insane one, not me. I didn't feel like yelling back, so I just left her. I needed some space. She tried to apologize to me over the next few days, but I didn't want to be around her. She even texted me saying if I wouldn't be her friend anymore, then life wasn't worth living. I was so tired of her threats, so I just ignored them. And then things got worse. A few days later, Damon and I were studying together when Sophie called me and said she was in the hospital. She told me that she had a brain tumor and they'd just done a biopsy to see if it was malignant or benign. I couldn't believe it. She asked me if I could pick her up, and I said, of course, this was so scary. I told Damon, and he just said, I think she's making it up, Maxine. How could she suddenly have a tumor? You guys just had a fight, and suddenly she's in the hospital? Come on, think about it. I was shocked. Damon, how could you? You're such a jerk. Then I ran off and arrived at the hospital to find Sophie sitting outside wearing a hospital cap. She said her hair had been shaved off for the biopsy, and I asked to see the scar, but she wouldn't show me. She said she'd get a headache if she took it off. I was just glad that she was okay, and gave her a ride home. We made up, and I decided to look after her for the day. She seemed so weak, I couldn't bear to see her suffering. I called Damon to tell him that he owed me an apology, and told him about Sophie. And he just said, Oh, wow, okay, sorry, hope she's okay then. 
But then a few days later, he called me and said, Listen, Maxine, Sophie's a liar. She didn't have a biopsy. I bumped into her earlier and her cap fell off, and she has a full head of hair under there. No way it would grow back that fast. Why would she lie to me? I didn't get it. I needed to know the truth, so after class, I went to her dorm. She opened the door right away, and sure enough, she had all her hair intact. She probably knew Damon had told me, and so hadn't even bothered to keep up the lie. This made me furious. Straight away, I started shouting at her. Honestly, Sophie, what is wrong with you? Why would you pretend to be sick like that? Friends don't do that. Sophie grabbed my hand and said, Maxine, I'm sorry. I was desperate. I only did it because I missed you and wanted you to care about me again. I took it too far, though. Please forgive me. Are you crazy? I screamed. I was worried sick about you. Are you sure there's not something wrong with you? Sophie started grinning in a weird way and said, The only thing wrong with me is that I'm in love with you, Maxine. She wouldn't let go of my hand, and I just stared in shock. Wh what, what did you say? You heard me. I love you. Then she started to manically laugh and said, I've loved you since the day we first met. I knew you were following me, so I pretended to be in danger so you'd come rescue me. Even my ex-boyfriend was fake. He was just one of my friends pretending. Can't you see? I'm willing to do just about anything to get your attention. If that's not love, then what is? This couldn't be happening. I tried to stay as calm as possible and said, Listen, Sophie, I'm flattered. Really, I am. But I'm straight. I see you as just a friend, okay? But Sophie wouldn't give up. She grabbed my hands again and said, How do you know that? You didn't even try to love me yet. Just give me a chance and I'll show you what true love looks like. I tried to let go of her hands, but it was impossible. Sophie grabbed my hands tighter and tighter that it even began to hurt. She looked me in the eyes and, oh my god, it's like I couldn't recognize her anymore. She looked like a crazy person, like a psychopath. Then she began to speak in a really creepy tone. You can't get away from me. You're mine now. I was so scared. I needed to get out of here. So I pushed her really hard that she fell on the ground and I ran like a mad woman out of there until I was back in my dorm. Then I called the police, but by the time they reached her dorm, she was gone. I told them what happened and showed them a photo of her. And you won't believe it. Apparently, I wasn't the only girl Sophie had attacked. There were other girls too. After that night, I was terrified. Everywhere I went, it felt like someone was watching me. Then one evening, after my shift at work, I was walking through the park back to my dorm when I heard someone up ahead. I knew right away it was Sophie, but she wasn't alone. She was with some guys. They spotted me and started heading towards me, but I ran as fast as I could, and luckily the police were just outside the park and went in and arrested them. Sounds like a coincidence, right? Well, it wasn't. Sophie's not the only one who can fool people. I knew Sophie was stalking me, so I told the police, and together we created this plan to catch her, and voila, it worked. Sophie, if you're watching this, I wish you all the best, but let's not meet ever again. That's enough stalking for one lifetime. Finally, my first day at school has come. Yay! This special occasion called for my favorite hoodie. Super cool, right? <laughs> but then, out of nowhere, I was blocked by a group of boys and their cheesy pickup lines. No time for monkey mm -hmm. business, but they wouldn't let me go. Hey, do you know who I am? I'm... Everything suddenly went blurry. Oh no, my glasses! I stumbled around trying to grab them back, but got shoved to the floor. Everyone scram. Give me that. I looked up and vaguely saw my hero offering me a hand. He gave me my glasses and I profusely thanked him, but he just gave me a cold look and walked off without saying a word. Strange. Oh, by the way, I'm Hazel Palmer, 17 years old. But I'm not here as a student, but a teacher. Yes, you heard it right. Not to brag, but I'm kind of a genius. <laughs> I even got offered a position in my college's research project, which I have rejected to pursue my dream of becoming a high school teacher. So, here I am, on my very first day of fulfilling it. 
First, I was introduced to the other teachers, but unlike what I had in mind, they just threw me judgy looks. Luckily, after the meeting, a young teacher named Rebecca kindly welcomed me and even tipped me off about some of the rebels at school. Now time to meet my students. As soon as I finished my introduction, the whole class immediately turned into a beehive. Miss, how about we continue this lesson at the movies tonight? Mullet, Paris knows. This guy must be the notorious Lucas that Rebecca warned me about. Please, as if you'd date someone who would wear such a goofy hoodie. Yeah, who let a weeaboo teach here? Jeez, I didn't expect this reaction. I tried to restore the silence, but to no avail. Ugh, I'm out of patience. Quiet, or else you'll all get Fs. Thank God it worked. Whew, that'll show them who's in charge. But here comes another problem. No way! There's gotta be someone who's really here to study, right? Okay, who is our class's top student? Ethan! Ah, didn't he help me in the hallway? But it looked like he didn't recognize me. Okay, let's see. Ethan, right? Could you solve this equation? Uh, equation? N no, equation. I suppose spelling is a bit hard for a numbers person like you. And the whole class burst into laughter. Jeez, this guy was unbelievable. Hmm, how about the second best student? Cassie Santago? That name sounded just like my old classmates. I turned to the corner where an arm reluctantly raised. Oh my, it's her! So good to see a familiar face here. But why is she avoiding me? That afternoon, while walking to my car, I saw Cassie and her friends picking on a girl. Upon seeing me, they immediately ran away, but I managed to catch Cassie. Cassie, since when did you become a mean girl? None of your business. Report me to the principal if you like. Then she strutted away, leaving me standing there confused. Since when had the sweet Cassie ended up on the dark side? Turned out, not long ago, Cassie's father passed away in an accident, leaving her to live with her stepmother. This must left her in so much grief that she put up this cold, reckless facade as a defense mechanism. That's so sad. So, to make Cassie feel included, and also to improve this whole class's performance, I came up with a master plan. More homework. Not finished? Minus points. And every lesson will come with a gift. A test during recess, and I asked Cassie and Ethan to help the other students. But when I called Cassie to the board, strangely, she couldn't do a simple equation. At first, I thought that it was just her being rebellious, but during the test that day, I noticed her copying Ethan's answers. Does that mean all her A's were from cheating? Not only that, the even shocker thing I found out was that Ethan was her stepbrother. After class, I came to talk to her, but she didn't pay me any attention. Cassie, I know the secret behind your A's. High scores mean nothing when they're not from your own hard work. But out of my business. <laughs> You're as much my friend as you are a proper teacher. I'd be pleased to tutor you. How about today? See you in the library after school. As if I care. Her words did hurt, but I guess she was just trying to keep her cold image. So I still waited for her, but she never showed up. No matter how much I tried, Cassie ignored me and kept cheating. During the midterm test, she even blatantly snatched Ethan's paper. It's true she's my friend, but I couldn't let it slide any longer, so I dismissed her test. That had to be done. <sighs> On the same day, while I was in the library searching for materials, I heard familiar voices talking. Ms. Palmer is way too much. She even dismissed Cassie's test today. Can you believe this? Why can't she be understanding like you? Cut her some slack, Sadie. She's just doing what she thinks is best. So that's what my students really thought of me? After everything I did to try and help them, yet all I got back was bad-mouthing? And Rebecca was so nice to defend me like that. No wonder they liked her. <sighs> A few days later, the unexpected happened. Cassie, Lucas, and a few others came and asked for extra lessons. Finally, they started to have another eye on studying. But little did I know that it's just a ruse from my dear students to turn the following days into a nightmare. And the instigator was Lucas, I supposed. One day, I almost fainted upon finding a huge ant nest inside my bag. The other day, my pants were stuck to the chair with some gum. <sighs> Fortunately, Ethan always showed up in time to help me. He's such a riddle. Unlike before, not only did he try to defend me in class, but he also helped me carry my textbooks. But I didn't expect him to care that much. One time, I saw him at the car wash where I worked part-time. I quickly hid behind a car, but Ethan just kept walking towards my wash box. I'm here to see you, so no need to hide. Let me give you a hand. After my shift, Ethan took me home. We talked a lot and I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my mom's health condition and how I took this part-time job to cover her hospital fee. 
This side of him was far different from the normal, and it was heartwarming. Suddenly, we noticed an elderly lady who seemed lost, so we offered to take her home. And guess what? She's the grandma of the notorious Lucas. I was truly surprised by how much of a rebel like Lucas cared for his Nana. I could tell he really loved her a lot. Poor boy. She's the only family he got now. Lucas, I know studying is not your thing, but have you thought about how happy your grandma would be if you at least tried? Since then, Lucas stopped causing me any mischief, and so did the other students. Now they could even do simple math themselves. Baby steps. <laughs> Seeing my effort finally bore fruit, I set up a parent meeting to report students' progress. Halfway through my presentation, a photo of me cosplaying as Sailor Moon popped up on the screen. Oh my god, why is it here? How dare you let this childish thing teach my kids? Then she stormed off, followed by everyone else. I thought I finally had my students on my side. Turns out I never did. Then came the last straw, my mom's medical test results. I couldn't help but cry, letting all my bottled up emotions out. Then, suddenly, a hand laid on my shoulder. What's wrong? My mom's health turned worse, and she needs an urgent operation. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all gonna be okay. Be strong, Miss Palmer. I appreciated him comforting me, and when I felt a bit better, we decided to leave. But the door was locked from the outside. It must have been a prank from my students, again. We tried banging the door and screaming for help, but eventually gave up and waited for someone to come. This quiet atmosphere sure does have a way of making people open up, and I got to know about Ethan. Seemed like both of us have problems with our beloved family. What's yours? I... I have a sister. You know who. That I really adore. But no matter how hard I try, she always builds a wall between us. Oh, wasn't this the first time Ethan talked about his personal life? He always put on a cold and distant mask. But I knew deep down he had his struggles too. I was so absorbed in his story that I forgot about being locked up and gradually fell asleep. Until a buzzing sound startled me. And countless phone cameras were pointing at us. Guys, check your phones. Look what Miss Palmer and Ethan have been doing this whole time. Oh my! A bunch of photos of me and Ethan have been uploaded on the school website. And from some angles, it looked like we were kissing. <gasps> oh no! I tried to explain, but they just threw me a disgusted look. And why was Ethan just standing here saying nothing? This soon reached the principal. He told me there would be a case hearing for inappropriate relationship with a student. How was this even possible? As I dragged my feet to the principal's office, suddenly I heard familiar voices shouting. Why did you do that? I told you to find her weakness, and look what you got. Nothing. I've done everything I could. What else do you want? Everything? Then why is she still here? As long as she's around, she messes up our cheating stuff, and mom will get my head chewed off for being useless at school. Or is that what you want, brother? What? <gasps> so Cassie had been pulling the strings this entire time? And Ethan was her puppet, befriending me just to please his sister. I knew she hated me, but did Ethan have to be so heartless too? Cassie then caught my eye, so I ran away. I was still trying to process this when I walked in to see the school council glaring at me. You're an insult to the teaching profession, which leaves us no choice. I was ready for the worst, when Ethan rushed in. Stop! It was me who deliberately jammed the classroom's lock to get back at her for being too strict, but I accidentally got stuck too. There's nothing going on between us. And so, I was cleared of all charges, and Ethan ended up in a week-long suspension. Why did he do that after all? After such a long trial, I drove around town to blow off some steam, then saw Cassie fighting with a security guard. I found out that Cassie stole a bracelet and was refusing to call her parents. The guard said he'd have to call the cops, so I came forward as her teacher to bail her out. Cassie asked me why I helped her, but I didn't bother explaining myself and just left. Since that day, Cassie didn't attend the extra classes. After his suspension, Ethan returned with his offhand attitude. <sighs> no time to worry about those two. My mission now was to prepare my students for the upcoming finals and regain my prestige. Luckily, they started to take studying seriously and invested a lot in these tests. One day, when I walked into class, some students even asked me to help solve advanced exercises. Two weeks later, when the results came, my excited students all rushed over to me. Miss Palmer, thanks to you, the questions were the same as the ones you showed us the other day, so it only took us a blink to finish. What are they talking about? Before I could understand, the principal summoned me to his office. 
As I entered, he angrily showed me the math sheet that I was allegedly teaching in the extra class. What kind of work ethic allows leaking exam questions, Miss Palmer? Leak the test? <gasps> me? No! Please! No more excuses. You're fired! No, no! They can't punish me for something I didn't do! Someone must have framed me! I asked my students where they got that piece of paper, and they said it was already on the table when they came to class. So Cassie and Ethan must have been behind this. Good job, Ethan, for putting up their remorse act just to set up a bigger plan to humiliate me. Okay then, they won. Unemployed and desperate, with hospital bills to cover, I had to work full time at the car wash, as well as taking night shifts at 7-Eleven. But besides the measly wages was a bonus of rotten eggs and tomatoes, scornful looks and snarky comments saying I didn't deserve the teacher title. <sighs> The scandal truly turned my life upside down. Then, when I was at the hospital with my mom, suddenly Ethan rushed in and said he would clear my name. Clear my name? Wasn't he the one who put dirt on me? What was he playing this time? With nothing to lose, I reluctantly went with him. He led me to the school's control room. The principal was also there. Then I saw Sadie standing on stage. Ethan said it was her who discreetly put the math sheet on the table. What? But, Rebecca, I distributed the test like you said, but I'm scared. What if someone finds out? Don't worry, now that Miss Palmer's fired, who else can dig this up? I'm only taking back my position as the beloved teacher who can take cover for y'all. No, I have to tell the principal everything. Who would believe you? I would. Furious, I rushed over to the stage and confronted her. Rebecca, I thought you were my friend. How could you? Don't ask me, ask your phony self. Weren't you just trying to get the students to like you? What nonsense was she saying? I'm just doing my part of being a good teacher. How could she be so selfish and cruel? Out of jealousy? Miss Palmer earned her students' respect with her pure heart. Look at you. The so-called love you have comes from buttering them up with all your lies. That's why they turn stubborn and make light of studying. I never knew you were that kind of person. How could you call yourself a teacher? The principal couldn't hide his rage. Fired Rebecca then apologized to me and offered me my job back. But after all these troubles, this school had completely drained me. I couldn't take it anymore, so I refused. As I was wiping away my tears, Ethan came to my side. Miss Palmer, I'm sorry for everything I did. I just tried to please Cassie, but now I know I was only hurting you. I've already known about that. I was about to leave when a group of students led by Cassie approached us. Then, Ethan told me it was Cassie who helped him with the plan to bait Rebecca into admitting her actions. Sorry for all the horrible things I did to you. Please stay. We've learned a lot since you moved here. Please don't leave us. Such a crazy term. I ended up staying. I mean, this is my dream job after all, and I'm not one to give up that easily. I also talked to Cassie's stepmom about her studying. Turns out, she didn't realize her strict approach was causing a rift between them all. Cassie, Ethan, and their mom had a talk, and now they seem to understand each other better. I was so happy for them, and we became friends after that. Time flies, and now my students, or my friends, to be correct, graduated, and would soon fly off to pursue their own dreams. Suddenly, Ethan dragged me to a corner. So from now on, we're no longer teacher and student, right? I guess, but so... But could you still teach me? Teach me how to love you. Hmm, I wonder who will hit the jackpot this week. How about that blonde Joseph? Nah, he's too slow. Or there's Arthur. Pfft, the last time that weakling even struggled to carry my tray of food. Seeing as there's a science test this week, I suppose I better pick someone smart. That's when I spotted Jace. His dad's my family's driver. Yeah, that nerd definitely won't let me down. So I'm Victor. I'm 17 years old and I'm rich. My father's contributed so much money to this school that he has more power than the principal. So no matter what mischief I cause, the teachers know it's in their best interest to turn a blind eye. And look, I'm not only rich, but also handsome. Everyone wants to be my friend. Everyday girls chase after me, but tough luck for them. I'm already dating the hottest girl in school, Jessica. As for the boys, it's only fair they get to spend time with me. 
so each week I choose one of them to hang around with me and do my errands. Hey Jace, congrats dude, it's your lucky week. Sorry, could you choose someone else? Jay said timidly, then walked away. What? No one ever dared refuse me. I pulled his hand back, but ah, he even spilled my juice box. That's it, nerd. You are so dead. The next day, I was standing by my locker instructing Arthur to sort out my books when I overheard Jace talking to his friend about the science essay. Ugh. I totally forgot that we had to submit it online by midnight instead of in class. Hmm, I know. I'll make Jace's assignment mine. <laughs> oh, genius. That afternoon, I told my PE teacher that Jace was on duty. So she made him go tidy up the gym after class. Meanwhile, I went to his laptop and copied his work. Well, essay, done. Easy peasy. A few days later, the science teacher called the two of us to the office and asked why our assignments were identical. But hey, not only had I submitted it first, but I also had my foot on his neck. So of course, I got to keep my A and Jace got an F. Ha! After school, Jace followed me to the car. Then when I was about to get in, he leaped in front of me and slammed the door shut. You're a cheater. You stole my assignment. No, nah, I'm the one who has to say that. I submitted it first. Hearing us arguing, Jace's father stepped out of the car and frantically apologized to me for what his son did. You should know who you are. Your dad's just a servant, which makes you nothing. I smirked. Then I snatched the key from his dad's hand and jumped in the car. I'll get home by myself today. Bye, losers. That nerd had ruined my mood, and now I needed to cheer myself up with some fun. Oh boy, that party was awesome. As I passed through a tunnel, I turned the music volume up to max and swayed along. Suddenly, I looked up to see a truck whizzing towards me, so I swerved just in time and crashed into the road railing. Jeez, what the... I mumbled, then got out of the car. Anyway, I left my car there and got an Uber home. But hang on. Why was everyone driving on the left side of the road today instead of the right? Maybe the combination of alcohol and dizziness was making me imagine stuff. I opened my eyes and stretched out my arms. Ouch! Um, this wasn't my room. In my drunken haze, I must have wandered into someone's shabby home. I rushed out of there and ran downstairs to find my mom and dad in the kitchen having breakfast. Victor, hurry up, else you'll be late. Oh, uh, don't forget you're helping your mom out in the grocery store after school. What's with all this role-playing? Where am I? Terrified, I ran outside to check. What? The address is correct. 138 Riverside. But my house was a magnificent mansion. What's this hovel? Surely this is just some dream, right? I rushed back into the house and shouted, Mom, Dad, what's happened to our mansion? Son, are you dreaming? Ha <laughs> ha, us rich enough to have a mansion. Now that's an unlikely thought. Now go change your clothes and I'll take you to school. No way. This was just a bad dream. Which often ends when we reach another location, right? Maybe when I get to school, everything will return to normal. Oh, school looks exactly the same. I was so relieved. I walked along the corridor and greeted people. Huh? Why were they blanking me? Ugh, have they forgotten who's the boss around here? But never mind, there's my honey bunch Jessica. I ran over to her and kissed her cheek. But I hugged my cheek in shock. My head was spinning, then suddenly someone nudged me from behind. It was Jace? I grabbed his collar. How dare he mess with me right in front of Jessica. Get your hands off my boyfriend. You're Jace's choice this week, so mind your attitude. Jace chose me? <laughs> Who do you think you are? A dog-poor dude like you wouldn't be able to have a proper life and to attend this school without my family. Take a look at yourself. Honey, ignore him. Let's go. Jessica rubbed his arm, and then they both left. I stood there dumbfounded. What on earth was going on? I felt like I tumbled into an alternate universe. I slapped myself in the face to snap out of it. Ouch! Why wasn't I waking up from this nightmare? This all started with that tunnel, right? If that was the door into this world, then it would also be the door out of this insanity. So I got in a cab to go back there. But wait, where was the tunnel? I made the driver go back and forth a few times, but it wasn't there. Then I ran out of money for the ride back, so the driver just left me there. Bewildered, I wandered around aimlessly till I reached a grocery store, where I spotted my mom working. Gosh, my mom, who always had servants around, now had to work her butt off? I couldn't bear seeing her like this and rushed over to help her. The next day I woke up early and thought that I'd choose a decent outfit to go to school. Well, life has to go on, so while I'm still stuck here, I should at least play my part. But, ugh, this version of me has terrible fashion taste.
And look, now I've turned into a real nerd. I need to change it up a bit. When I arrived at school and opened my locker, there was a list of orders from Jace. What? Clean all of the dirt off his sneakers? This was nonsense. So I threw the piece of paper into the trash. Then out of nowhere, Arthur quickly picked it up and whispered into my ear. Dude, I suggest you do as Jace says. Why? He's ridiculous. To keep the peace. No one actually likes him. We're only nice to him because we don't want any trouble. And seeing Jace approaching, Arthur hurried away. Over the next few days, I saw it firsthand. People sucked up to Jace, but then behind his back, they were mean about him. He walked around like he ruled the school. He even got one kid expelled just because they reported him when he cheated on an exam. Such a spoiled brat. Also, Jessica was such a gold digger. One time, I caught her flirting with one of those basketball guys. I even overheard her say, If Jace wasn't a rich kid, I wouldn't look at him twice. He's just an ATM to me. Hang on. If Jess thought that about Jace, then did she think the same way about me when we were dating? So all this time, Jace never had a real friend, just like me before. Honestly, he was detestable, but pitiable at the same time. After that, I noticed that Jess kept on giving me these flirty looks. I didn't want any trouble, so I ignored her. Then one time when I was in the hallway, she stormed over to me and yelled, Why are you avoiding me? No one ever rejects me. I was trying to stay away from her. Then, from nowhere, Jace appeared throwing a tantrum. What's this about? I didn't have a chance to explain as Jess immediately rushed over to Jace. Honey, he keeps approaching me. He won't leave me alone. It's not like that. She's using you. I looked at him in panic. Parking lot, 3.30 p.m. You'll pay for messing with my girlfriend. Then the two walked away, hands in hands. So, after school, I nervously went to the parking lot. He threw the car key at me and sneered. Drive! You better do as I say or else I'll make sure you're expelled. It didn't look like I had much of a choice. So I decided to go with him to find out what that maggot would do. He made me drive him home. <laughs> Simple enough. But then as soon as I opened the door, my dad appeared. And in a pleading voice said to Jace, Please, sir, don't have my son expelled. Dad, what are you doing? Apologize to him at once, no matter what the reason is. Dad looked at me with steady eyes. Jace sneered at my dad and said, how about you take the blame so we won't get expelled? Then he threw a bunch of money at my dad's face. You're fired. I shouted at him. You can't treat people awfully just because you have money. Victor, stop. You're wrong. Please, I saved you from the accident, so please forgive my son. Then dad pulled one trouser leg to reveal his artificial leg. That was the first time I saw my dad cry. Wait, this reminded me of what happened last year. I was being such a jerk to this guy that he purposefully drove towards me for vengeance. But Jace's dad darted forward and pushed me out of the way. I know he was badly injured, but as an insouciant boy, I didn't think it was a big deal. Whoa, I really was so arrogant. I expected everyone to bow down to me, and I actually thought everyone wanted to be my friend, when in actual fact, I had no true friends at all. My head felt like it was going to explode. I wanted to run away, so I jumped into the car and drove away without thinking. I stopped the car when I saw it, the tunnel that had changed my life. Suddenly, this blinding light shone straight into my eyes. The next thing I knew, both me and the car were gravitating towards the light. Huh? Where am I? It looks like a hospital. Then I heard a yelp of delight and someone held my hand tightly. Oh, it was my mom. Thank goodness you're awake, she said, as tears streamed down her cheeks. Mom, Dad, why am I here? What day is it today? Son, it's May 22nd. You've been in a coma for the past three months. We weren't even sure if you were going to make it. It turns out that day, on the way home from the party, in the tunnel, I had a terrible car crash and ended up in a coma. So what I'd been through was just a dream, right? But the odd thing was that the time I'd lived in that mysterious world completely coincided with the time when I was in the coma. Could parallel universes be physically real? Whatever that strange universe was about, one thing was for sure. I'd learned my lesson. After being discharged from the hospital, I went back to being Victor, Jack a dandy. But don't get me wrong, I was not the extravagant me of the past. No, I'm a changed guy. The first thing I did when I returned to my normal life was to break up with that gold digger, Jessica. But the hungry leech kept begging me to get back together. How shameless. Next, I for sure have to stop making other kids do my errands and started to have small talk with them instead of giving orders. Now there was only one thing left to do. I needed to make amends with Jace. I asked my parents to give his dad a raise and also throw a little dinner party this weekend to invite his family around. 
as I felt bad that I haven't had a chance to thank Jace's dad properly for what he did for me last year. Of course, my parents gladly agreed and said that they're proud of me for being so thoughtful. So I'm preparing a little peacemaker gift for Jace too. I bet this is going to make him geek out all the way. <laughs> Hmm. I wonder what's taking Valerie so long. She's been in that changing room for ages. Valerie? Is everything okay in there? Don't force it if it doesn't fit. No, this is the last dress in store. I just need to breathe in for a bit longer. So? It's beautiful, isn't it? Valerie spun around. Then suddenly... Yep. Trying to squeeze into a dress two sizes too small for her, then it split. <sighs> the giggles around us started. Valerie blushed, hurriedly paid for the dress, and pulled me out of the shop. Why am I so fat? Ugh! I just want to feel pretty on my date. If I was skinny like you, I wouldn't have this problem. Poof! You know, it's not as easy as you think being thin. Yep, you heard me right. Being thin has its downsides. First of all, fashion. My nightmare. I have to wear an extra small size, and the clothes still hang off me. Actually, most of my clothes are from kids' stores, so I feel so untrendy. Then in winter, I have to wear tons of layers just so I don't freeze to death. And in the summer... I can't wear cute clothes as I look like a coat hanger. Not only that, because I'm so skinny, people often ask me to do nonsense stuff. Once, I was studying in my room when suddenly I heard my sister Camilla calling me. She'd forgotten her keys and forced me to climb through her tiny window gap to get them. Seriously, I can't even... Then, on another occasion, Valerie made me crawl into the classroom locker to help her cheat on her Spanish test. Unfortunately, the teacher walked in while this was happening and gave me a week's worth of detentions, of course. Ugh! Oh my god, No Way Home is so good. I literally can't think of one bad thing to say about it. Yep, the part near the end? Ah! Yep, guess what? I'd managed to trap my foot in a manhole. Man, what rotten luck. I tried pulling my leg free, but it was no use. It wouldn't budge. There I was, freaking out that I'd be stuck here forever, and all my friends could do was huddle together and ask me questions like, Madeline, how on earth did you get your foot in such a small slot? Wow, that's unbelievable. Even Jaden, my bookworm friend, took out a ruler from his backpack and started measuring how wide the slot was. Grr. My dear friends, I'm being stuck down here. Stop gopping and help me! Finally, they tried helping me out, but in the end, we had to call the rescue squad. By this point, a massive crowd had gathered around me and strangers were filming me. When I was finally free, everyone looked at me and held back their laughter. Even Parker, my crush, was smiling. Jeez, this was beyond embarrassing. But a hot guy like Parker would never notice a moving skeleton like me anyway. <sighs> Don't think like that, Maddie. You're so pretty. Show me some confidence, would you? Valerie said as she nudged my arm. I put the book down and glared at her, and suddenly noticed Parker walking towards our table smiling. And, yep, he said he wanted to sit with us. Even though I was cheering inside of my head, I still had to act composed. And, oh my god, can you believe he even said I was cute? After that day, Valerie kept on encouraging me, saying he had definitely given me a green light. So, finally, I gathered my courage to write down all my feelings for Parker on a note and clipped it to his notebook. At the end of class that day, he came to my desk and took my hand. Yay! Everything was fine, great even, until one day 
when the two of us were taking a romantic walk past the Swan Lake, Parker suddenly turned to me and said, You're so beautiful, Maddie. And if you just put on a few more pounds, I swear you'll be the hottest girl at school. Yes, I know, but it's hard for me to gain weight. No big deal. Just leave it to me. I'll fatten you up. I thought Parker was just joking, but it turns out he was being deadly serious. Since that day, every time we went on a date, instead of taking me to the bowling alley and movies as usual, Parker would take me out to eat. I swear, I've tried all the restaurants in our town. More surprisingly, on my birthday, Parker even gave me a bouquet of fried chicken. How romantic! But this didn't change anything, as my weight still stayed the same. Parker was disappointed when he peered over me and saw the scales hadn't budged. Then he sighed out. How come you and Valerie are friends, but look totally opposite? Here comes our adorable chubby Valerie. What? Parker called Valerie adorable again. This wasn't the first time either. Annoyed, I put down my fork and walked away from them. After that, I started avoiding Valerie. I did homework with other friends, sat with other girls at lunch, and every time I happened to see Valerie, I turned around and walked away. Honestly, I didn't want it to be this way, but just seeing her made me uncomfortable. But I couldn't bear to see my boyfriend call my BFF cute. Well, he thought I was too skinny. <sighs> then summer break finally rolled around. I thought it'd be just me and Parker, but then he went off to a summer camp in Spain. <sighs> the plan was all ruined. So I spent a whole sunny day inside sulking. What's wrong? Are you bored because your lover is away? So why don't you take this time to surprise him when he returns? Surprise? A great idea popped into my head. But, but how do I get chubby? Easy peasy. Okay, if it's that easy, then show me. Okay, if you do my summer homework for me. What? She's such an opportunist. But I really wanted to pile on the pounds and please Parker. So, without hesitation, I nodded in agreement. So, from that day on, I started following Camilla's weight gain plan. I switched veggies for greasy foods, and my main meal was always late at night. I also changed water for milkshakes, but I did have to stop drinking them when the smell of milk alone made me feel sick. Seeing me eating crazy like that, my parents worriedly said, Madeline, eating healthily is important, else your health will be affected. But I ignored their advice. This time, I definitely had to gain weight. Finally, after a month of trying, I gained some weight. Yay! I looked a lot more attractive now, didn't I? I was studying myself in the mirror when I heard my phone beep. It was Parker. He was coming over tomorrow with a present for me. The next day, I put on this hot dress that I'd never felt confident enough to wear before, and I asked Camilla to help me do my makeup. As soon as I finished, I eagerly waited for Parker in the living room. The doorbell rang. I excitedly opened the door. But as soon as he saw me, Parker quickly said, Oh, sorry. I have the wrong house. Then he started to leave. Huh? He didn't recognize me? This will be fun. No, honey, you're not mistaken. It's me. Your destiny. Madeline? Is that really you? Oh my, how on earth can you be this big? We've only been apart for a month. So, you don't think I'm prettier now? To my surprise, Parker shook his head. No, no, you're so fat now. It doesn't look okay. Lose some weight. Huh? This was so confusing. I thought he wanted me to be bigger. As annoying as this was, I still listened to Parker and tried to lose the weight I'd put on. <sighs> so, it turns out that losing weight is far trickier than it sounds. Actually, it's a million times harder to lose it than it is to gain it. After a month of healthy eating and exercise, 
I gained another pound. Ugh! Stop eating that. Are you giving up already? You must try harder. What? It's just some popcorn. Why does he have to be so rude about this? I'll give you two weeks to lose weight. Else we're done. Huh? What did he just say? Done? He was the one who wanted me to gain weight in the first place. Now he was threatening to break up with me if I didn't lose it. How ridiculous. You know what? I don't need two weeks. Let's end it right now. It's clear you never loved me at all. You only like my appearance. If you truly cared about me, you wouldn't care what size I was. Then I walked off. Ugh, how could I have been so stupid? For the entirety of my relationship with that jerk Parker, I was blindly following him. I only cared about pleasing him, and it cost me so many things, including my best friend. I needed to apologize to her right away. I nervously knocked on the door, then waited. Finally, Valerie opened it, but on seeing me, she went to shut it. I'm so sorry. Just let me explain, please. Valerie, I'm so sorry. It was all because I was afraid Parker would leave me for you. But I realize now that he's a massive jerk, and I was an idiot for ever trying to change for him. Jeez, you're crazy. Parker is totally not my type. I scratched my head and told her about how terrible Parker had treated me and how I'd foolishly listened to him. Man, that douchebag! Then she hugged me. Valerie confessed to me that she'd been trying to lose weight by lowering her calorie intake, but the pounds were coming off. And worse still, she felt weak and tired all the time. I nodded in agreement with her. So, from then on, Valerie and I made a promise to love ourselves, regardless of what size we were, and to never let anyone try and change us. And look, that's Walker and Joel our awesome boyfriends who love us just the way we are. And you know what? It feels so good not caring what other people think. So don't ever let idiots put you down. Because when you allow yourself to just be you, then you can finally realize just how beautiful you truly are. Finally! My spectacular sweet sixteenth is here! I spent months deliberating over every tiny detail of this perfect butterfly-themed party. Better yet, all the VIPs from the fashion industry were invited! Pretty impressive, huh? By the way, I'm Charlotte Stone, a fashion influencer with over 500,000 followers on Instagram. One day, I'm going to become an iconic designer just like Tori Burch. This party was my big chance to get noticed by all of these big shots. But wait, Ava? What on earth is she doing? Don't you realize how important it is to sort out garbage? It's not all junk. Like, this one is very valuable. Oh my gosh! Ugh! And now she was replacing the guest's napkin with some biodegradable tissue. Suddenly, she startled and rushed to an incoming guest. Your scarf! Is that real mink fur? You ruthless monster! Oh no, that was Trixie Maxflower! The famous drag queen, who's now strutting off in anger thanks to my sister's outburst. Ava was ruining everything with her hippie ways, and all of my guests were leaving. No, 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 it's all ruined, and it's all her fault. Ugh, this wasn't the first time Ava had pulled things like this. She called herself an eco-activist, and constantly brought rubbish home to remake into things, argued with anyone who didn't sort their waste properly, and forced everyone she knew to join climate change protests. The worst part was, I was always dragged into those dumb campaigns. It's super embarrassing being called the trash girl's little sis. Lonnie, where are you going? Wait up! Hey trash girl, why don't you recycle this into skating shoes, huh? Next thing I knew, a gross banana peel landed smack bang in my face. Lottie, are you okay? No! My party was going perfectly until you barged in with your lunatic eco-anxiety. I wish you'd left my party, not them. Actually, I wish I didn't have a tree-hugging, trash-loving sister at all. 
Then I pushed Ava aside and stormed off. She'd gone too far this time. But maybe what I said was a bit much? The next morning, I woke up to see a birthday gift from Ava on my bedside table. It was this cute bracelet. Made from recycled plastic, of course. It made me smile and reminded me of all the time she'd taken care of me. I went to her room to thank her for her gift, but she wasn't there. Then, I spotted a letter on her bed. Mom, Dad, Charlotte. I'm going away to live by my beliefs and values without affecting you all. Don't look for me. Oh no! Don't tell me that it's all because of what I said yesterday! She knew I didn't mean it, right? I'm sure she'll calm down and come back soon. But then, one week passed, then a month, and now it's been almost two years and my sister still hasn't returned home. We've looked for her at environmental events, but still had no hint. Until one day, I stumbled upon a YouTuber who talked about discovering an eco-friendly island run by a community of environmentalists. Hmm, that sounds like Ava's style. Wait a minute, I've seen this before. This island looked just like the one from the picture hanging in Ava's room. There it is, that must be the island's coordinates. I gotta go find my sister. Oh boy, that was a long ride. Now I just need to find a boat that will take me to the island. Let's check the map. Huh? These are my stuff? Right at that moment, a woman reached me. Hey, what are you doing with my bag? I quickly apologized and returned her bag, then rushed back to the train to find mine. But I was too late. No phone, no map. What to do now? I asked around, but no one had heard of this eco island. Hopeless, I slumped onto a bench, when suddenly a man tapped my shoulder and told me that his boat was heading to that island. I followed him to the harbor, but when I saw the boat, I immediately changed my mind and turned to leave, but the man wouldn't let go of my hand. I tried my best to resist as his two scary looking crewmates headed towards us. Oh no, this isn't gonna end well. Let her go. Noah, is this a kidnapping? Should I call the cops? Panicked, the man let go of me, then grumbled and left. I trembled in shock, and it took ages for my heart rate to return to normal. I can't imagine what Ava had to go through out there all this time. Why are you trying so hard to get to the Eco Island? It doesn't seem like you're seen. Now that I'd calmed down and looked at this guy properly, ooh, he was cute. And he knew about the island? Turns out he's a former resident and was now taking his sister there. I asked him if he knew anyone named Ava Stone, but he shook his head, saying that most people who came to the island changed their names to start a new life. Okay, so I just have to see for myself if Ava was actually there. However, Noah said he couldn't help, because the island has strict rules concerning newcomers. So I had to lie that I was also an eco-activist to convince them to bring me along. And... Ha! It worked! My hunch told me that I was now one step closer to finding Ava! That evening, Noah set up a tent on the beach and we waited there for a boat that was scheduled to take us to the island in the morning. Seeing Noah take care of Ellie made me miss my sister so much. My selfish stupidity had driven her away, but now I'm going to put things right. I'll definitely find you, Ava. Next day, Noah woke me up so early that even the gulls weren't about. We got on this rickety looking sailboat without any engine. Hello? Were we going to the island or back to the primeval times? Noah helped sailing the boat while I had to take care of the ropes. This was way harder than it looked. I could barely feel my arm muscles. Best wind ever. Charlotte, you're our lucky charm. <sighs> but yeah, at least I had this beautiful view to compensate. Suddenly, the rope slipped out of my hand, causing the winch handle to spin and fling my bracelet into the sea. Oh no! Noah tried to stop me, but I was already deep in the water and immediately got swarmed by garbage. There it is! I pushed the trash aside, grabbed the bracelet, and was about to swing back when a fishnet caught my foot. Ah! I'm stuck! While struggling, I saw a dead sea turtle, tangled in plastic bags drifting by. Is it foreshadowing my own fate? Then, I felt a tug on my waist, and suddenly I was rising above the water. Through coughs and splutters for air, I saw Noah. He'd saved me again! How could you be so foolish? You're lucky I reached you in time. No, you're the lucky one who just got yourself a new girlfriend. Me? 
What's wrong with you? Your actions could have killed yourself and my brother, and all you can think about is flirting? I'm sorry, but that bracelet is really important to me. And I'm serious, what is your type of girl, Noah? M me? Oh, I... maybe someone... mature and brave? Got it. From now on, I'll be more mature then. By the next dawn, I could finally see our destination. But right when I stepped foot on the shore, two men who seemed to be village guards stopped me. You said you were bringing one sister, not two. Who is she? She's with me, Noah said. I tried my best to convince them, but they insisted on following the rule. No outsiders on the island. I didn't want any drama. All I wanted was to find my sister. Hey, the chief is coming! Jeez, what else is happening? I grabbed Noah's hand and hid behind his back. Please don't leave me alone. I won't. With my eyes closed, I heard someone step in and the female voice said, What's all this commotion about? Wait, that voice. I took a peek at the village chief. It's... Ava! Ava? Is it really you? Charlotte? I found my sister. I rushed to hug her as tight as I could. I've missed you so much. Oh, little Lottie, how did you get here? I've missed you too. I'm so sorry for what I said. I... It's okay. I've forgotten about it already. Come, let me show you around. Turns out, the day she left home, she gathered like-minded people to come to this island and save its ecosystem. They built this village and a dike to protect the island from rising sea levels. When Ava asked me about my journey here, I told her all about the struggles I had to go through and how Noah had saved me. You like Noah? I guess so, but what's wrong with that? I mean, you always hated my eco lifestyle, but Noah and I, you do know we share the same mindset, right? That's true. They had many things in common, while I was like, living in another world to them. It's okay, I've changed a lot since the last time you saw me, Ava. I was wondering if I could, um, stay here for a while? Ava, agreed! Yay! Now I will have some more time to persuade my sister to go home and to win my man's heart. So as the newest member of the village, the next day I started helping everyone with their tasks, like collecting coconuts, making DIY stuff, and planting corals. I even made use of my fashion sense and came up with stylish designs that were also environmentally friendly. Although Noah was too busy to see my creations, other villagers were very excited about them and often visited my workshop to try on new clothes. Hey, sunshine. These designs are top-notch. You're like a tailor goddess. Um, that's Sam, my coworker at the workshop. He seems odd, but he's actually a genius who could create technological devices out of scrapped materials. Each day, he gave me a different kind of weird gift. This guy was definitely having a crush on me, but even his unicorn bicycle made from seashell couldn't move me as I only had eyes for Noah. Speaking of Noah, he just walked past my workshop, right on time to show him this new material. I eagerly ran towards him, but stopped as Ava suddenly pulled him toward the hammock, leaned closer, and whispered something in his ear. What? So, when Noah said he preferred mature girls, he meant Ava? But what was my sister thinking? She knew I liked him. After that day, I couldn't concentrate on anything because of those two. Noah started to make excuses to not clean the coral reefs with me. And guess who was behind it all? Ava! Ouch. Great. I accidentally just stepped on the sea urchin. So I was rushed to the medical hut. Ava also came over to ask if I was okay, but I refused to talk to her. Or Noah. The wound swelled up, and I still couldn't walk normally a few days later. Surprisingly, Ellie started being nice and took care of me and even went spying on Noah and Ava for me. Those two are made for each other. I even saw them secretly kissing a few times. They're the perfect king and queen of this island. Now there is no doubt that they're dating behind my back. How could Ava do this to me? Feeling betrayed, I dragged myself to the workshop. Maybe work can distract me from all this mess in my head. But here I was, stuck with Sam and his cheesy pickup lines. You must be exhausted, because you've been running through my mind all day. Ugh, just leave me alone. I stormed out of there, but tripped and fell over. Right then, a hand reached out to help me. It was Ava. Jeez, she's the last person I want to see right now. 
You don't have to pretend you care about me. You know full well that I like Noah, but you still got with him. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm leaving today! And so should everyone in this village. This place is for cowards who ignore the real eco problems that are happening in the outside world. There, I'd let it all off my chest. But unexpectedly, the villagers came out of the bushes, holding decorations and a birthday cake with my name on it. They were throwing a surprise party for me. Oh no, I, I didn't mean to. Just hardened by my words, they all left. I guess you saw me with the chief when we were planning your birthday surprise. There is nothing going on between us. I thought you'd grown up, Charlotte. But I was wrong then. God, the guilt I felt right now was killing me. Frustrated and ashamed, I knew I couldn't stay here any longer. I waited until everyone was asleep to sneak to the beach and set sail on a small boat into the stormy night. But I couldn't make it far before a giant wave engulfed me and the boat. This is... The end, I guess. But when I opened my eyes, Noah's face appeared in front of me. Did you just save me again? No, the chief did. But where is she? Noah didn't say anything, but just looked glumly out to sea. Wait, this is not happening. My sister can't be out there, right? No, no, no. How can I live knowing that my sister drowned because of me? Are you crying for your missing shoe? I turned around to see Ava, alive and well. Ava, thank God! I giddily jumped towards her, but ouch, I forgot that my leg was still hurt. I'm so sorry for how stupid and selfish I was. Don't be foolish next time. Nothing's going on between me and Noah. He's all yours. I looked at Noah and we both turned to motto red. The next day, Ava gathered everyone around so I could publicly apologize to them. I was ready for the villagers to throw coconut shells at me, but instead they admitted that my words were partly true. This lifestyle needs to be promoted to the world, since everyone deserves to live in a clean and healthy environment that requires a joint effort. Then they all agreed that the perfect person to influence the young generation about this matter was me. Wow, I didn't expect that, but yes, I'm willing to carry out this meaningful mission. And Noah volunteered to leave the island and go inspire the outside world with me. Only then, Ellie apologized to me and confessed she'd made up the stories about Ava and Noah just to make me give up on flirting with her brother. I thought you'd only cause him trouble, but now I know he likes you a lot. So promise that you'll make life easy for him? I'll try my best, kid. Promise. It's been five years since we left the island, and I fulfilled my dream of becoming a famous fashion designer. But most importantly, I was able to make fashion eco-friendly. Pretty cool, right? When the fashion show ended, I went on stage and the crowd went wild with applause. My creative inspiration comes from my dear sister Ava, who's shown me how vital a clean environment is to each and every one of us. I also want to thank Noah, my incredible boyfriend, for his unconditional love and support. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. As I finished the speech, Noah came on stage with this huge bouquet, while Ava and the villagers showered me with hugs and praise. I guess one trip to an eco island could change your entire life, right? Hey, I'm Sage, but you can call me Witch. That's what all the townspeople call me anyway. My folks run a funeral home called Black Rose, and some superstitious people consider this a bad omen. By some, I mean the entire town. Everything about us is spooky and weird. Wanna see our house? It kinda has that monster house vibe, and looks like a fort in the middle of this dollhouse neighborhood. I did try making friends with the other kids, but it never worked out. Ah, don't eat the cookies, they're poisoned. Despite all that, mom and dad found their work meaningful and put a lot of effort into it. Well, maybe a little too much? I guess the reason why they're so emotional is because they know what it feels like to lose someone dear to them. My little sister Leah's missing, and it's all my fault. We'd searched for her everywhere for five years, but still, no news. It was a terrible time for my family, but instead of showing us support, the neighbors spread absurd rumors about Leah's disappearance. Some said the devil took her, while others said we sacrificed her during a satanic ritual. These heartless people were never going to change their minds about us, so I decided to just go along with it. This is why no one dares to bother me, as they don't want to be cursed- Ouch! 
Oh, sorry, miss. We're just trying to catch that bird. Please don't curse us. Jesus, that poor little thing. If you hurt an innocent creature again, I'll turn you into one and see how you like having stones shot at you. Blood drained immediately from their faces as they screamed and bolted. I carefully took the bird out of the bush, then brought it to my forest house. This is my secret hideout deep in the forest. I have my own garden where I plant herbs to heal injured animals. This isn't a wild bird. It even has a name. It must be someone's pet. Okay, Skye. So you like to sneak out, huh? The world out there is dangerous. I should bring you home. I followed the address on Skye's tag and took her there. Guess her owner wouldn't be happy if they thought a witch had cursed her, so it's better not to show myself. No one wants anything to do with a witch. But no matter how annoyed or scared they acted, I just don't care. Having the place to myself has its perks. But then out of the blue, a guy slumped on the chair opposite me. How dare he? I could feel his eyes peeking at me. Another idiot wanting to test his courage. Hey, Sage, right? We're in the same English literature class. But in case you didn't know, I'm Mark. Why should I know your name? Oh, I... I just wanted to... If you don't want to get diarrhea, sleep paralysis, or skin rashes, don't ever talk to me. Then I turned around to leave, but tripped over something and fell forward. You alright? This is crazy. Who asked him to do that? Then I came home to find an angry crowd in front of my house. Those eerie sounds are keeping us awake at night. What kind of dark magic are you practicing? Your black sorcery made my curling iron overheat and burn my hair. Must be some demonic influence messing around here. Turns out, strange things were happening to every house in the neighborhood. So these superstitious people blamed everything on my family and even wanted to kick us out. We can't move. We have to wait here for Leah. She's with the devil now. She's obviously not coming back. So go away. Never talk about my sister like that again. Get out of here. Coincidentally, there was a loud rumble of thunder right at that moment. Horrified, they started pointing and calling me a witch. Go home, everyone, for your own safety. I'll take it from here. This man is Mr. Thompson, the town's mayor. He came with an offer to help our family move away in peace. Believe me, it's best for everyone. If and when your daughter comes back, you'll be informed right away. After he left, my parents seemed to be thinking about moving away for real. What's gotten into them? We didn't do anything wrong. Why do we have to leave? I'm not going anywhere. My parents might be weak, but I'm not. I'll wait for my sister here. She promised me she'd help me care for those poor creatures. She will be back. Achoo! What was that? It sounds like a guy's sneeze? Who's there? Show yourself. Ugh, you idiot. Come out alone. Both of you, now. Those two look familiar. Right, they're Meg and Nick, the infamous best friend duo in my school. It turns out, they were curious about the strange phenomena happening at Meg's house too. They wanted to see if I was really using witchcraft to cause all that. We didn't expect to see you healing animals here. Why do you let people think you're a witch? They can call me a witch, an alien, or whatever. I don't care, as long as they leave me be. I hate it when people annoy me, which is what you two are doing now. Quit following me and never come here again but they didn't leave. Instead, Meg told me about a black rose that always appeared at the scene. Of course, it reminds the townsfolk of my family. Nick thought that made no sense. I mean, if it really was us, why would we make it that obvious? Hmm, someone's clearly trying to frame us. That's it. If I found that person, my family could live here in peace again. We'll investigate together. We can catch the bad guy and be heroes, like a detective squad. Sounds like you've been watching too much Scooby-Doo. And why aren't you guys scared of me? Actually, I'd make a great Daphne. And come on, we just saw you feeding the cats. Even if you are a witch, then you must be a kind one. The next day, I was going downstairs when I heard some chattering noise. Are those angry townsfolk back? I was about to scare them away, but I saw my parents warmly welcoming Meg and Nick? This is the first time I'd had friends come over, so my parents were overreacting. I hurriedly pulled my so-called friends out of the house. I guess disturbing me has become a habit to you, huh? We didn't know how else to contact you. Anyway, we'd like to introduce you to an IT expert. He's agreed to help us. Then suddenly, a guy standing behind the black rosebush appeared and said hi to me. Isn't that the guy from the library? This is Mark, the newest member of our squad. Good to see you again. I hope you'll remember my name this time. So this Mark guy was really serious about this. He's now telling Nick how he could get data from all of the cameras in the neighborhood, which sounded like some kind of alien language to me. 
Look, our tech genius found something. Mark is awesome, right, Sage? Um, I guess? Um, someone hacked into these houses' networks and was causing their electrical appliances to go haywire. And every night at 11 o'clock sharp, the camera would be disconnected. Not for long, just enough for someone to place a black rose at the scene unnoticed. Can you track down that hacker's IP address? Yes, and also their coordinates. That's Clara's house? Wait, Clara? The drama queen who always plays up everything about me? Does she hate me that much to target my whole family? We reached out to Clara to talk privately, but she flat out denied everything. What is wrong with you? Did this witch hypnotize you into becoming her slave? Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> we have proof. You can't get away with this. Are you threatening me? This is illegal. I will tell my father about this. You think you're a big deal just because your father is the mayor? Big enough for you to watch out. She's the mayor's daughter? What's with that smug attitude? Everyone in this school remembers how she embarrassed herself last year after Mark rejected her. You may not know this, but Mark is the most popular guy among the girls in our school. It, um, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in those girls. You don't have to explain yourself to me. I don't even care. The atmosphere suddenly became weirdly awkward. Well, now the only way is to stalk Clara and catch her red-handed. But we've been sitting here for an hour and nothing's happened. This snooping scheme is so silly. I was about to leave when Mark stopped me. Someone was coming out of Clara's house. Gotcha. Still trying to deny it now, Clara? Mark took off his mask, but who is this man? He suddenly flung out, then attacked Mark and ran off. We were about to chase him when Mark cried out in pain. Meg and Nick told me to take Mark home while they chased after the guy. I brought him home. Hmm, this house looks so familiar. Oh, this was the owner's house of Skye the bird I'd saved. Mark explained he'd seen me bring Sky back and was impressed with the note I'd left on how to take care of its wound. I knew everyone had been wrong about you, so I wanted to thank you and be your friend. I'm not someone who can make friends. Then I quickly left. The next day, Mark helped us arrange a meeting with Clara at the cafe where he worked. When Clara heard about the man coming out of her house last night, she seemed shaken and said he was probably one of her dad's staff. However, when Meg asked her for her help, Clara refused. We hit a dead end again, but Mark said he already had a solution. Before he could tell us, the cafe owner appeared and told me that spooky stuff was happening and asked me to leave. The holy statue, the town's symbol, was broken, and they found another black rose at the scene. Meg and Nick immediately jumped to my defense, but he didn't listen. He also forbade Mark from hanging out with me or else he'd fire him. I'll leave now! See? I'm not good at making friends. I only bring them trouble. I dashed away so no one could see me cry. However, suddenly, someone's hand grabbed mine, then pulled me onto the bus just as it arrived at its stop. Mark? What are you doing? He'll fire you! I quit. That kind of boss doesn't get to fire me. It's all my fault. Don't worry. I have a ton of different jobs. Waiter, dog walker, even babysitter. Anything that makes money. What's the money for? This bus will take you to the answer. We got off at the last stop, an orphanage. So Mark was donating the money he earned to these orphans. Promise me you'll show them your true kind side. At first, I wasn't sure if I could, but then I gradually opened up to these sweet kids. Suddenly, I saw a familiar figure watching other children having fun from afar. Is that Leah, my sister? Turns out, five years ago, a lost kid was found wandering by the bus stop. She was so scared that she couldn't remember anything about her family. She only said a few separate words like funeral or dead people, so the nuns thought her parents had passed away and took her in. During her time here, she couldn't blend in with other kids. Seeing how Leah pushes others away, I saw myself in her. She shouldn't live her life the same way I do. I then called my parents and they came to pick us up right away. Oh boy, it surely was the tearful reunion of the century. Thank you so much. We only found Leah thanks to you. I'm glad to help, but that's not all. I've got something else to show you. As it turned out, Mark bugged Clara's phone at the cafe. It recorded a call she had with her father, exposing him as the culprit behind the town's mishaps. It appears Mr. Mayor wanted to build a shopping mall, but he needed to clear up some space for it. Using my family's bad rap, he played spooky tricks on the townspeople to scare them into selling their homes for cheap. When Clara found out the truth, she begged her father to stop, but he refused to. Meg and Nick posted the recording on the internet, causing outrage among our town. 
The cops arrested him, and my family's name was cleared. All our neighbors apologized to my family for letting their superstitions blindside them. My parents were obviously touched, so they forgave them all, and threw a party. So my family was reunited. Not only did I find my sister, but also three good friends. Well, maybe two good friends, and one more than just a friend. Augustine and I almost took down this fake Roblox plushie smuggling empire when the gang leader suddenly turned vigilant and ordered his members to arm lock us. Pablo, you got it all wrong! We're here to make a business deal! You don't fool me, you sneaky little rats! Think you can catch me? I am invincible! <laughs> suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Pizza's here! Please take your order! Did any of you morons order pizza? S sorry, boss, I, I did. I was starving. Please, could I have a bite quickly before executing these snakes? Go get the door, you dumbo. You, hands over your head. Pablo then came, hide behind the door as it opened and standing there was Jane. Hi, lunchtime. Jane then pulled up her skirt slowly, revealing her stocking. While the gang were dumbfounded, Augustine quickly restrained the gang member, while Jane slammed the door onto Pablo. And me? I stomped onto the guy's foot, elbowed him in the face, and pinned him on the ground. Phew, all hail Queen Jane. Hi, my name is Naomi, a special agent, and these are my partners, Augustine and Jane. With Augustine as leader, we three have successfully cracked the hardest cases, including this one. Augustine is such a respectable senior agent to me, while Jane is actually my annoying stepsister slash partner. It's your turn to write Pablo's case report. Don't push it onto me. Why do you always try to get away with tasks? Just like how you made me do all the dishes at home all the time, too. Team, we got a new case. Amy, straight A student. Lawrence High's representative to the upcoming United Nations event. Missing since Monday. Urgent request from parents and the school to bring the subject back safely. Suspect number one, Shirley, direct competitor for the school representative title, a mean girl in disguise. So, starting tomorrow, we'll be students at Lauren High to investigate it. Can I join the girl posse and befriend Shirley? Nothing helps spilling the tea easier than blending in with the gossip girls. Okay, but we also got Diane, Amy's stepsister. Quiet and shy. Parents are freaking out and asking her to be watched 24-7 too. Jane, what do you think? I can approach Diane and keep an eye on her. Great. Remember team, do not act by yourself under any circumstance. Lawrence High, I'm coming for you. On the first day of school with my excellent disguise, I confidently strode to the classroom. My mean girl covers quickly got everyone's attention, including this guy. Hey cutie, let me show you around, and you can show me the way to your heart. Marco, Lawrence High's jock with a notoriously long list of ex-girlfriends. Meanwhile, Augustine's also taking a good chunk of the ladies' hearts, including Shirley's, my target. So, I purposely walked past her, showcasing my $200,000 Hermes bag, and... Hey, you. Yes, take the bait, fishies. You seem to have a sensible fashion style. Want to join our group? Sure, I'm Naomi. Right then, Jane passed by. In the shy, nerdy girl covers, of course. Hold on for a second, rookie. Did you borrow your granny's dress for school? Right, Naomi? I... I think... Oh, this hurts my eyes too. Who in God's name wears pastel pink in 2023? Shirley and her entourage were cackling, while Jane gave me a hostile look and stormed off. Oh, please. She didn't have to take it so personally. She should thank me for that instead, as now she can naturally be friends with Diane too. Since then, I started hanging around with Shirley and the girls. They love gossiping, which is indeed pointless until the topic of Amy came up. Have guys seen Amy around at all recently? Amy, who on earth? Amy Hayward, the one competing against you for the school's representative. Oh, that stupid contest. I couldn't care less about it actually. Thank God it's over. I only joined it cause my dad kept insisting. Shirley didn't even remember Amy, nor did she want to compete with her. And now that I've noticed, she's boisterous at times, but actually quite straightforward. My guts are telling me it's not her. So, I brought up my concerns about the case at our next meeting. I'm pretty sure Shirley is clear. What? Do you even think before saying? She's her number one suspect. Plus, from what Diane told me, she's always picking on other students. Yeah, but that doesn't mean she has ill intentions towards Amy. You need to stop judging people too quickly. 
Excuse me? How about you stop siding with the devils? Or you find it hard because you're one too? Enough. Let's just keep your assumptions on hold for now. We need more clues before acting on anything. Dang it. If only I got some solid evidence. Jane just always slowed down the investigation. So the next day, I went to find Diane myself to ask some more questions about Amy. But Marco stopped me with... A bunch of roses? Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Be my girl, will you? I was still processing this when Augustine came from afar and went straight into the roses. Oops, sorry, I had my sunglasses on. Marco looked like an erupting volcano while Shirley gave an earth-shaking squeal. Eee! Oh, that body and that grace. Oh, great lord, please spare me. During independent reading, Marco and his army came marching toward Augustine to pick a fight. But Augustine completely ignored Marco, which infuriated him even more. Hey, you! Turn your coconut head around and have some courage to face me. Augustine calmly stood up returned his book as if Marco was invisible, and came to ask me to have lunch with him? He pulled me out of there, leaving Marco behind, grunting like a mad pig. It feels good living student life and having the boys chasing after you. Stay away from those teenage boys from me, will you? I don't see why. Don't get your identity revealed. Don't worry, and Marco's such a kid, not my type. By the way, you want to experience a heartfelt infatuation too? Think Shirley is laying an eye on you. The look on his face is priceless. <laughs> Who would have thought this charismatic Asian is actually allergic to girls? During PE, I saw Shirley purposefully tripped and fell in the direction of Augustine, but ended up on the floor instead. Augustine then dashed over to me for help when Marco stopped him midway. Still holding grudges with Augustine, Marco announced a dodgeball war. Oh boy, didn't know what he got himself into. Augustine is our top agent. He dodged every single bullet aimed at him, let alone these plain red balls. In return, Augustine gave Marco one hit of a lifetime that knocked him down on the ground. Lucky for him, Diane was nearby and kind enough to give him a hand. Still, Marco gave the biggest grin when he spotted me and headed over to hand me a piece of paper. Will you go out with me? What a loser. He must have taken a new interest in you, Naomi. Rumor had it he asked Amy out, but then she went missing. Probably that poor girl couldn't handle him. <laughs> Marco met up with Amy before she went missing? Uh-oh, he's our number one suspect now, not Shirley. I eagerly updated Augustine on Marco. I have a feeling Marco knows something about the case that might lead us to Amy. I was thinking I could pretend to go on a date with him. That's too dangerous. What if he's behind it all? You might get into trouble, Naomi. No worries, he seems really into me. He asked Amy out and she went missing right after. Who knows what could happen to you? But he's the only lead we have now. Shirley is already out of the picture, and I know how to protect myself if anything happens. Please? And... Yes! The time has come for me to end this case. During the date, Marco was so caring, but I was dying to know what happened to Amy that day. So, I heard you and Amy were a thing before? Nah, we never got together. How can you be so perfect? Are you an angel? I heard otherwise. Rumors had it, you even went out with her. Let's just focus on us, why don't you? But I want to know more about you too. Fine, fine. If you want to know it that bad, I did ask her out, but I never saw her that day. Her sister showed up instead, sat there at a reserved table and said something about Amy wouldn't be around for a while. I thought they wanted to mess with me, so I just left. Diane knew Amy would disappear even before she went missing? Did Diane have anything to do with this? She might have been the very piece that we'd overlooked from the beginning. I got to the office and saw Augustine fidgeting around. Are you okay? Did Marco do anything to you? I'm fine, and I got the biggest news. I then told Augustine and Jane everything and posed my doubts for Diane. Why Diane? She's just a vulnerable victim who gets picked on all the time. And you know by who? Shirley. She might appear vulnerable, but who knows what she's got inside. And you remember how she came to help Marco up that time? Now that I think about it, she was so worried for him. She obviously likes Marco. It's possible she might get jealous of her sister. Oh, stop. Not everyone is a jello like you. What? Team, this is getting nowhere. For now, let's just agree on keeping Diane close. Again, no one is to act by themselves. A jello? Just watch me nail this case before you do, Jane. The next morning, I saw Diane secretly watching Marco play basketball. I swear to God, Diane is definitely into him and involved in her sister's missing. But Augustine wouldn't let me do anything. That'd leave me with the only option. 
which is to keep Diane's activities on watch. Indeed, she's been acting very strange lately. She received regular phone calls and would get out of class, just to return with a troubled face. I decided to tail her that afternoon. She looked very suspicious and kept turning around to check if anyone was following her. She's definitely hiding something. We were walking for quite some time, passing a vast area of abandoned field crops until she stopped in front of a shabby house. This is clearly not a building for residency. The whole place looked so torn apart and even had traps everywhere. Thank God I had all that training back in the academy to spot these deadly traps. Suddenly, I saw a flashing shadow sprinting right across the room. I quickly followed and saw a door leading to the dark basement. Diane, or whoever was staying here, is not going to be simple to deal with. Oh no, it's a trap! If you dare move an inch, you're done. Now tell me, who are you? Are you from the Dixie Mafia trying to get back at me? Mafia? N no, you got it wrong. I, I came to check on the electricity for this building. Please calm down. She's lying again, Mr. Gordon. I knew she was up to no good. Speak now if you want to stay intact. Oh no, no, no. I should have listened to Augustine and not let my stupid adrenaline take over. Is this the end of my mission? The end of my life? Suddenly, there was a loud banging sound. FBI, don't you dare touch her. It's Augustine. FBI, what? No, no, what's happening? Are you not from the gang? Jane was there for me too. She quickly took the bomb remote and turned it off. Fake bomb, are you kidding? I quickly got out of the trap safely. Special Agent Naomi Cooper, where are you hiding Amy? No, no, you got it all wrong. Mr. Gordon's Amy's biological father. How can he hurt her? I looked at Augustine and Jane, who were as shocked as I was. Mr. Gordon used to work for the gang, but he turned his life around. That's why he thought you were the old gang coming at him for revenge. Not long ago, he contracted a serious illness that needs a kidney transplant, and Amy is the only relative he's got left. You're telling me Amy agreed to give him a kidney? Then why are you here in the dark? Why hide? Because Amy's mom hated me and forbade me from seeing her, let alone giving me a whole kidney. But Amy is my daughter with a golden heart, even though I didn't want to. She insisted on giving me a kidney so I could live on. If mom knew about it, she would never agree. That's why Amy had to run away to have the transplant done with Mr. Gordon. Where is she now? Resting in that room. Don't worry, Mr. Gordon has been taking well care of her. Meanwhile, I help bring them food and necessities. I quickly kicked the door open and saw Amy lying on the bed. What was all the commotion, Diane? Did you bring dad some squash? Augustine, Jane, and I saw it through now. We all got it wrong this whole time. The next day, we went to find Amy's mother and had a talk with her. She was shocked at first, but after knowing everything, she realized how wrong it was to separate father and daughter. She was so touched by her daughter's precious heart and agreed to let Amy come visit Mr. Gordon from now on. Looking at the sisters makes me think about my own sis. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. We gave each other a tight hug. We are sisters too in the end. Well, case closed. Let's go for some grand celebration, shall we? Actually, I have a date now. Why don't you take Naomi with you? Then she just left us there, cheeky Jane. I'm so relieved you're okay, Naomi. Because if anything happens to you... Yeah, Augustine? If anything happens, I would die for you. It's me again, Lou. In the last episode, Naomi went crazy at me when she thought Jeremy had cheated on her with me. Then she took it too far and tried to destroy my reputation by locking me in my room so I wouldn't be able to take on the host role of the fashion show. Luckily, a mysterious stranger rescued me. All I knew was that he wore cufflinks with the letter M on them. After that, 
Just when I wanted to give Naomi a piece of my mind, I saw her crying as she found out Jeremy was with another girl. I comforted her and we made up. Then we all went to Arkansas to Will's family's hunting ranch, and that was when I realized who had rescued me that night. Mark! I couldn't stop glancing at Mark's hand as we all ate. It all made so much sense. After the barbecue, Mark said he wanted to go to the observatory to get some fresh air. This was my chance. I waited a bit, and then I headed over there so I could thank him. When I got there, Mark glanced at me, but then he turned back and kept looking at the view. I took the cufflink out of my pocket and showed it to him. Then I smiled as I said, So you're my knight in shining armor then? The one who saved me from Naomi's horrible prank? Mark looked at the cufflink and then said to me, What are you talking about? Listen, I don't have the time or energy to get involved in Naomi's stupid pranks. Although I was quite surprised by Mark's denial, I figured he was just shy. Then I said, It's okay. Don't be shy. I just want to thank you. But before I could even finish my sentence, he'd walked away. All right, I know this guy's stubbornness. If he didn't want to admit it, I would not bring it up again. So I just smiled and put the cufflink back in my pocket and headed downstairs. After that night, I couldn't stop thinking about Mark. Why had he rescued me? I thought he was the worst when I'd first met him. But that night in Vegas, we'd had so much fun. But then he'd left me all alone. But then he'd rescued me. It was so confusing. He'd acted cold because he had some cool guy persona to keep up, but I could feel that underneath he was the sweetest, caring guy, and this just made me want to get to know him even more. Back at Plutus Heights, I felt closer to everyone after the trip. Aaliyah was being particularly sweet to me, and one day she came to my room while I was working on a project. She looked sad and let out a big sigh as she said, Lou, you gotta help me. I really need some advice. What happened? I asked her. Then she said, My parents want me to marry the CEO of their partner company. They said it'll give our family more power and make us look good. She was almost crying as she told me this. I couldn't believe that in this day and age, there were still people arranging marriages like this. All for status and power. That's not how love works. What happened to freedom of choice? She was sobbing now as she told me the rest of the story. This man has been chasing me for a while now. He often visits my parents' house and I thought it was to see my dad. But now I realize it was because of me. It makes me sick. My parents keep saying I'll never have to worry about a thing because he's super rich. But, but, he's 41. I don't want to marry some old rich guy. What? He was like double her age. Aaliyah was only 19. That was insane. What were her parents thinking? I comforted her and asked, Did you try telling your parents you're not interested? She said, I did. I tried everything. I begged them. But they insisted that I follow the family tradition that a daughter's marriage should be chosen by the parents because they know what's best for her. Honestly, could my life get any worse? Poor Aaliyah. I felt so sorry for her. Is there anything I can do to help? I asked her. She looked at me through tears and said, Really? You'll help me? So I said, Um, duh. We're friends, right? That's what friends are for. So then she told me she needed to find a guy who would pretend to be her boyfriend because she'd already blurted out to her parents that she was dating someone. Then she said, my mom and dad want me to meet him this weekend to see if he's suitable enough for me to marry. Have you found anyone yet? I asked her. Then she said, nope, but I need someone good looking, smart, and most importantly, he must come from a rich family. Out of our friends, the only one who ticks all of those boxes is Mark. And, okay, I'm going to be honest with you now. I've had a serious crush on him ever since I moved in here. So maybe this is my chance. I know it's so awkward to ask him, but you're in his investment club and you two talk to each other quite often. So can you go ask him for me, please? Okay, I didn't like this idea one bit. Aaliyah said she had a crush on Mark, huh? I weirdly felt so uncomfortable knowing this. Suddenly, I realized that 
I seem to have a crush on him too. Ever since returning from the trip to Will's hunting ranch, he had always been the last person I thought about before falling asleep. But then, maybe it was just to trick her parents. And she was my friend. I had to help her, right? So, I told her I'd chat to Mark. Gosh, I'm a good friend. She was so happy and said, Oh, Lou, thank you so much. Make sure he knows it's not for real. It's just a favor. He'll be saving my life. Okay, cool. So, it was all just to please her parents. It wasn't real. And I had nothing to worry about, right? Aaliyah had been such a good friend to me, so this was the least I could do to help her. The next day, on the way back from the investment club, my car stalled right in the middle of the road and wouldn't start. I had no idea what was wrong, so I had to call and get assistance. As I was on the phone, I noticed Mark's fancy convertible parked next to me. Get in the car, he said. I just called the towing service. OMG, I couldn't believe it. Once again, he showed up just when I needed help. He really was my knight in shining armor. I got into his car, and there was this super awkward silence. Then I plucked up the courage to speak to him. Mark, are you free this Saturday? Um, I wanted to ask if you could do me a favor. Would that be okay? I'm never free, he replied. Oh, okay. I mean, I knew he was a very busy person, so it was stupid of me to have even asked him. But then he said, What do you need? Oh. So he was giving me a chance. I then told him Aaliyah's story and then nervously asked him if he'd pretend to be her boyfriend to impress her parents. I did not expect Mark to respond in the way that he did. He just laughed and said, How childish. Can't you think of a more convincing way? Aaliyah should just prove to her parents that she was mature enough to make her own marriage decisions. Aaliyah tried, but it was hopeless. I put on my most persuasive face and stared at him with my puppy dog eyes all sad. This face always won my parents over, and I really hoped it would touch his heart too. He took one look at me and looked like he was about to laugh, but then he said, Fine, but just this one time, okay? I don't want to get caught up in all this immature love drama. Yes! It had worked! Without even thinking, I reached over and gave him the biggest hug. I couldn't stop smiling. In a second, I secretly wished it was me who got to take him to dinner with my parents instead of Aaliyah. Then, something crazy happened. Saturday rolled around, and Aaliyah invited me to the dinner too. She thought it would make things less awkward because her parents already knew me, and I may help the conversation flow. Well, things didn't exactly go to plan. After only 10 minutes of sitting together, Aaliyah's parents outright said that Mark didn't deserve Aaliyah, that his family wasn't prestigious enough, and that they'd only gotten rich from investing in some land, and that it was just luck, not hard work or talent that had got them to where they were today. I looked over at Mark. His face was bright red, and I knew how much this was hurting him. For a guy with high self-esteem like Mark, this was just too much to bear. He immediately stood up and politely excused himself, then walked out of the restaurant. Aaliyah got up to chase after him, but her mom grabbed her arm and stopped her, so I went instead. When I got outside, I tried to pull Mark's hand back, but he pushed me away and shouted, Are you satisfied? They just insulted my whole family. And what's wrong with being lucky? Just because they were lucky doesn't mean they didn't work their butts off to get there. My parents are the hardest working people that I know. No one insults my family like that. No one. Do you hear me? Now leave me alone. You and Aaliyah, stay away from me. Mark, listen to me. Her parents didn't mean it like that. They're just blinded by their family tradition. They can't see past it. You're an amazing guy. Not many 19-year-olds work as hard as you do. You're so talented, and I admire you for this. Honestly, you're so inspiring. Mark just stared at me. Maybe, other than me, nobody had ever said that to him. Then, after a silent moment, he opened his car door and offered to drive me home. He was silent the whole way home. But after that evening, he acted differently around me. 
He'd always been kind of grumpy, but it was like he'd softened now and became more friendly to me. Every time I saw him, he smiled at me, and it made me so happy. He was also much more open to me. Our conversation not only revolved around the investment club, but we also shared our hobbies, family, dreams, and the things we wanted to achieve after graduation. The more we talked, the more I realized how talented and determined he was. His strictness in the club was actually how he trained himself and others to achieve their goals. That really made me admire him. And I'm not gonna lie, that admiration in me was slowly turning into a special feeling. Well, I think it could be love. As for Aaliyah, after that incident, she apologized to me and Mark for getting us involved and said her parents were so traditional. Other than that, she never mentioned this crush she had on Mark again, and I felt relieved. At least I could comfortably hang out with Mark and dream of a further future between us without having to worry that it would upset Aaliyah. And then one day, Mark asked me if I wanted to go to the grocery store with him to pick up some snacks for our Plutus Heights movie night. I happily agreed, and in the store, Mark suddenly turned to me and said, Can you hold this, please? I turned around to take whatever he was holding and said, Sure, what is it? Then he grinned and said, My hand. In the middle of the store, he grabbed my hand and didn't let go. O-M-G! I couldn't believe it! This was the most romantic thing anyone had ever done for me! I couldn't believe how much he'd changed. He was so cute! I blushed and held his hand tighter. In that moment, I'd never been happier and I wanted Mark to be by my side forever. Stay tuned for season two, where the drama of Plutus Heights continues. Will things develop between Mark and I? Only time will tell. It's me, Lou. I'm back again to tell you the next part of my story. Firstly, here's a quick refresher. So, in the last episode, I discovered that Aaliyah was responsible for all the hate mails, so she got asked to leave Plutus Heights. Then, Naomi moved out too, so I moved in with her, and that's when she told me she was in love with me. Fortunately, after I politely rejected her, we could still be friends. As for things with Mark, we bumped into his parents in a French restaurant right on our six-month anniversary, and his dad told him to break up with me. I hoped that he would protect me from his dad's insults, but no! Can you believe Mark didn't even stand up for me? I was so angry, and we started quarreling. Then I went on a trip with Naomi, David, and Will, where Will told me that if I was his girlfriend, he'd never let anyone hurt me. So, that's a quick recap of the last episode. Now, are you ready for the next part of my story? When we got back from that trip, I felt much better, because it reminded me how amazing and supportive my friends are. I kept thinking about what Will had said, that I had to go speak to Mark and see if he thought we had a future together. Maybe he was right. However, Mark and I hadn't even talked since then. In fact, he hadn't even tried to contact me. This silence made me exhausted. Although I couldn't forget what Mark's dad had said about me, I still loved Mark so much. And honestly, I missed him like crazy. I couldn't wait any longer, so eventually, I decided to just call him. 
When he answered, he sounded like he didn't even have time to speak to me, and his voice had such a cold tone. I found myself apologizing to him for what I'd said, because it was not okay. Then I said I wanted to continue with our relationship, and that we didn't need to worry about the future yet because we were still so young. Mark agreed, but he didn't say much, just that he was busy and would call me back later. Afterwards, I felt relieved. The cold war between us had made me sad and miserable, but everything was going to be okay. And yet, I couldn't get his cold tone out of my head. Why was he acting so indifferent? Did he not love me anymore? A few weeks later, things weren't much better. I could count on one hand the amount of times Mark and I had seen each other because he was so busy with the company and the investment club. As for me, I had to study a lot before graduating so that I could help my parents. It was really frustrating. If I didn't call Mark, he wouldn't call me at all. I often looked at the cufflink that I'd found when he saved me and found myself getting lost in thoughts of the past. He used to call me all the time, no matter how busy he was. I missed that. Suddenly, I was so worried. It felt like our love was fading, and nothing could prevent it. If that really happened, how would I cope? One day, I called my dad to see if he was okay, and he sounded exhausted. Then he told me something that shocked me even more than the bankruptcy. Him and my mom were getting a divorce. I couldn't believe it. I asked him how this had happened, but he just sighed and told me that he wanted rest and would call me back later. And then he hung up. Eventually, I called my aunt, who was my dad's sister, to find out the truth. She said that my mom had been having an affair with a rich man who'd been my dad's partner for a long time because she couldn't stand this poverty anymore. Oh my god, this was too much. There I was, wrapped up in my petty love drama, when in fact, my dad needed me. This had to be the most difficult moment of his life, and there was no way I could leave him all alone. I got to my parents' house, and I was shaking as I opened the door. I wanted to wake up from this nightmare to have my mom back. When I saw my dad sitting on the couch, he looked surprised to see me. He just smiled and asked me to come sit down. It looked like he'd lost some weight and he told me my mom had moved out a few days ago. I couldn't hold back my tears. Our lives were falling apart. My mom hadn't even told me any of this. She just made the decision by herself and left. How could she do this to us? How could she be so selfish? Back at Plutus Heights, everyone knew my parents were getting divorced. Naomi and David had texted me to comfort me, but Mark hadn't even texted me once. He must have known because David was his cousin and told him everything. So what was wrong with him? He was my boyfriend and he didn't even care. All he had to do was call me or even just text and say he hoped I was okay. But nope, nothing. Suddenly, I realized how stupid I'd been. I'd been chasing him this whole time. And now when I needed him the most, he was nowhere to be seen. That evening, I decided to make dinner for my dad, and it made me think about the good old days when mom was still here. My dad loved to cook, and my mom would always be his assistant, helping him chop veg and clean up the kitchen. I missed my mom so much. Why did life have to be like this? Love was so fragile. Could Mark and I get through this? As I was wondering about this, the doorbell rang. I ran to open it, and to my complete surprise, Will was standing there with a bottle of wine and a basket of fruit. I literally gasped in surprise. What was he doing here? He just smiled and said he'd had a meeting nearby and wanted to pop by to say hello. My dad was excited because ever since the bankruptcy, no one had been around to visit him. My dad went into the kitchen and started cooking, and Will and I helped him. Will chatted to my dad in such a friendly way, and they were getting along so well. Every so often, Will would look over at me and smile. It made me blush, and I didn't understand why. The three of us sat down to enjoy the meal, and it made me happy to see my dad so excited. He couldn't stop chatting to Will, and even asked him if he had a girlfriend at one point. He just laughed and said, I'm just waiting for the right girl. Then he looked at me. Suddenly, 
I felt a bit flustered and reached out for the bottle of wine. But Will reached out at exactly the same moment and our hands touched. I blushed and felt so embarrassed. What was wrong with me? Was it because I was drunk? Will must have sensed I was embarrassed because he changed the subject and started saying how he was a big fan of the dishes in my family's restaurant and that he missed it so much. So my dad said he could come over whenever he was free and my dad would cook them for him. Then they continued to chat about food and business and Will said that even though he couldn't afford to help my dad rebuild the business, he wanted to invest a little bit to help him open a small restaurant and start again. At first, my dad was so shocked and moved by Will's suggestion, but then he agreed and kept thanking him, saying that cooking made his life more meaningful. I couldn't believe it! Will was being so kind, and I didn't know how to repay him. I told him I'd pay him back after graduation. Then after dinner, he stayed and chatted to my dad for hours. I could see it really cheered my dad up. I was so grateful to Will and couldn't stop thinking about that evening. He'd made me feel so secure and he was just so considerate. Soon, we were about to graduate. We decided to organize a ceremony along with a big photo shoot together to celebrate and it was going to take place at a resort which was owned by one of our classmates' family. However, just before, there was a rumor going around that Aaliyah's sensitive photos had been exposed and her rich fiancé had decided to cancel their wedding even though it was going to be in a few weeks. This was such bad news for Aaliyah. I wondered if she would come to the ceremony. Well, anyway, the ceremony day arrived and tons of photographers had been hired. There was so much wine and food and there was even a red carpet. It was so fancy, and we all took photos together. This was our last party as students, and we wanted to make it one to remember. Mark hadn't arrived yet, as he said he'd had a meeting to go to first, so it'd be a bit late. I was hanging out with Naomi and Will. As for Jeremy, he had a drink and chatted with others on the other side to avoid Naomi. Then, after a while, Aaliyah arrived too. She looked really annoyed and Naomi whispered to me to be careful around her, in case she caused any trouble. Well, not one minute later, Aaliyah was marching towards me. She was smirking and said, So your family went bankrupt, and yet, you can still afford to attend this fancy ceremony? Lou, honestly, you don't belong here. Run back home to your poor family. Finding that what she was saying was nonsense, I just walked away from her without saying anything. Honestly, I had nothing to say to that rude girl. But then I heard Naomi and Aaliyah arguing. Naomi was saying that Aaliyah had no right to judge me. And then I heard Aaliyah shouting back. That's when I realized I had to do something. I stepped in between them and asked them to stop. But Aaliyah wouldn't give up. Suddenly, she pushed me into the pool. The next moment, I was under the water and I was shocked. I couldn't get to the surface. I was choking and struggling and felt myself sinking. Right when I was panicking the most, I could just make someone out, jumping into the pool and grabbing me. I thought to myself, Mark, is that you? Saving me again? Then I passed out. As I opened my eyes, I saw a boy standing over me, soaking wet. He was calling my name, and he looked so worried. I was still so scared and was clutching onto his wrist. Then I saw something familiar. The cufflink. Is that Mark? I thought. But when I started to see more clearly, I realized it wasn't Mark. It was... Will! He was so relieved to see me awake and alert, and gave me the biggest hug. Then he asked Naomi to help me up while he ran to get my coat. Aaliyah still had the audacity to stand there and laugh at me. Look, everyone, it's Lou, the drowned rat. She's so poor, she has to rely on rich guys to look after her. Pathetic. Naomi was so angry, I thought she was going to hit Aaliyah. She told Aaliyah to shut up and leave me alone. People were pointing at us and saying something. I turned around, and that's when I saw Mark. He was standing in the crowd, looking at me. When he saw I'd seen him, he just turned around and walked away. I have never felt so small in my life.
clearly, our relationship was over. To make it worse, Aaliyah saw Mark leaving and said, Like father, like daughter, your mom left your dad, and Mark has left you. Serves you right. Who would want to be with a poor girl? My heart was completely broken. Was Aaliyah right? Had Mark left me because I was poor now? What did it matter anyway? It was over. But there was something else on my mind. The cufflink. Had I mistaken Mark for Will? Was it Will that had saved me that day? In the background, I could still hear Aaliyah mocking me, but I just blocked it out. Naomi was hugging me, telling me everything was going to be okay, and then Will appeared and put my coat over my shoulders and said, You don't need to worry about a thing. Then he took my hand, and we left that mess behind us. Hi, I'm Aubrey, a super smart girl with an IQ of 200, and you should be ready for my mind-blowing story. Before I continue, please like and subscribe. I grew up in a small village in the countryside where people farm for a living. My family struggled to put food on the table, so I could only attend a monastery school. But since childhood, I've always been kind of different. The system is crashing. Please wait for a moment. The chicken is $15.55 minus 15%. Cereal is $2.49. Potatoes, laundry detergent. So the total comes to $64.85 with the discounts and tax included. Mom soon realized I was a gifted child, so she helped me skip some grades. And by the age of five, I was already doing secondary school math. I always topped my classes and other students would bribe me with candies to ask for help with their homework. At the age of eight, I scored 760 on the SAT math and won the spelling bee competition. I became a phenomenon in the area, and reporters even gave me the Stanford Bennett IQ test, which showed I had the same intelligence as a 22-year and 11-month-old person. My parents were super proud of me, especially my dad. Dad, they all gave me Lego and comics for rewards, as if I was an eight-year-old. Yeah, yeah, they're wrong. You're eight years and five months old already, little lady. He was the only one who could spark interesting conversations with me. That is, until he felt terribly ill. But good surgeons were nowhere to be found in this remote countryside, and we couldn't afford to take him to the center either. We were desperate to see a situation get worse and worse. Then he passed away, leaving us in the depths of despair. Soon after, Mom couldn't afford my school fees anymore, so I had to drop out. Aubrey, I'm so sorry. Don't worry, Mom. There's nothing that school can teach that I can't learn by myself. So she signed me up for a library membership and turned out the best memories I cherished were here, where I could immerse myself in interesting knowledge from all around the world. I was walking down the aisle, absentmindedly running my fingers along the spines of the books, when one caught my eye. And the memories of my dad rushed back to me. If he had been operated on, he'd not have lost. I started turning the first few pages and was captivated immediately. Then suddenly, a fiery desire sparked in my heart. I want to become a surgeon. So I studied every medical book I could find, especially the ones from this author, and decided to save money to enter medical school as soon as possible. To get closer to my dream, I moved out to the city and applied for a job at a coffee shop right next to the medical school. Only... You've broken 10 plates this week already. Are you trying to break a record? Come on, boss. It's just some plates. Not like I burned the whole shop or something. This will be deducted from your salary. Repeat this and you'll be fired. Okay, that's my fault, but I knew he wouldn't fire me. There's no one else who could memorize so many orders all at once. Even Diner Dash Master. Later, I was going to serve a group of students when I heard they were discussing an emergency case. We have to remove that blood clot in segment four of the liver and flush the left lobe. Definitely have to start at the middle hepatic vein. Is this dude serious? Absolutely not. A less intrusive cut would be along the falciform ligament to allow access to segment three. Everyone fell silent and looked at me like I was an alien. Suddenly, the middle-aged man among them stood up. Nice work, young lady. Your method is much more efficient than my student's answer. Which class are you in? Oh, I'm not a medical student but I aspire to be one day. The man asked me to sit down and continued asking me other medical questions, and I answered them all with ease. My adrenaline was rushing. Since my dad passed away, I hadn't had such an interesting discussion. Then, a few days later, the man came back and revealed that he was Dr. Sean Lewis and the principal of the medical school. OMG, you're my favorite author! I admire you so much! 
Thank you, young lady. Anyway, I came here today with an offer. I was impressed by the knowledge you have in the medical field, and I think you deserve a full expense scholarship to the most prestigious medical school. Can someone pinch me now? This was truly a blessing from heaven that I would definitely not let slip away. Here comes my first day. I went to school extra early to explore as much of the campus as possible. This place was so much bigger and better equipped than my old school. I was looking around the hallway to find my class when someone bumped into me. Oh, isn't it the gave the wrong answer guy at the cafe? He just coldly said sorry and hastily headed to the class over there. 412? It's my class too. I learned that he was Henry, the top student of the class. But obviously he wasn't that good. They'll see. All the theoretical classes didn't make me break a sweat, and I even spotted some mistakes made by the professors. When lunch rolled around, I went to the cafeteria, approaching the first group that caught my eye, and they seemed to be friendly. Want some of my fries? Potato fries contain a high amount of trans fat, which is associated with type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. One day you'll have a stroke, and then you'll know why. Thank me later. They all pouted and left right away. Did I say something wrong? Right then, a nice girl came to me. I'm Laura. Mind if I sit? Sure. Then she told me she was isolated too, just because she wasn't as smart as the other students here. Why are they so mean? Hey, why you gotta be bothered by those toxic people? Do they give you a penny for your thoughts? It's not about how many friends you make. It's about finding one that knows your worth. You're right. I'm Aubrey, by the way. I know, I was in the same class with you this morning. And the way you argue with our professor? Wow, that's impressive. Laura and I quickly became friends. It's great to have her around, who could truly see my brilliance and always encouraged me to express myself. Today came a big event. A conference was held by none other than Dr. Lewis. But little did I know that this event would become a battleground between Henry and I. Determined to impress Dr. Lewis, I eagerly raised my hand at every opportunity to answer his inquiries. Each time I did, Henry would swiftly raise his hand as well, competing for Dr. Lewis's attention. We argued back and forth, neither backing down until the end of the conference. After that, Dr. Lewis announced that there was one slot available in his upcoming research project, which would go to the top student of this term. The room buzzed with excitement and anticipation. My heart skipped a beat, for working with Dr. Lewis had been a lifelong dream. However, other students started cheering Henry's name. Jeez, I swore I would beat his butt off and show them who deserved it. Time to prove that I was not only unmatched in theory, but also in practice. I was the very first one to finish stitching up the incision. Uh-huh. But as I reached for my gauze, I couldn't find it anywhere. It must be around here, I swear. Oh no, I left it inside the dummy. Okay, this time must be better. How hard could it be to use this defibrillator? But then I accidentally touched the metal pad and got shocked and fell backward. I kept trying in many other practice sessions, but that sucked. Aubrey, this cast looks exactly like a chicken thigh. Do it again. But the most annoying thing was that Henry excelled in all of them and other students started mocking me. After that, I went outside for some fresh air and deep down, I was so disappointed in myself for all my failures. Suddenly, a hand gently patted my shoulder. It was Laura. I couldn't help but hug her and start sobbing. Laura, what if I was wrong about myself? I failed at everything and people started humiliating me. Oh, they just envy you. Nobody can beat your academic scores. That's why they gloated at your failure in practice. But that big brain of yours is what matters the most, right? Y yeah And an opportunity is coming your way. There's an intelligence contest next week. If you win, everyone will have to recognize that you're the best, including Henry. Talk about Laura, my savior. I'll try my best. Just wait and see. A few days later, Laura took me to the library in a private study room. She helped me set up my laptop and left me alone so I could focus. Good luck. I participated in an online oral contest over Skype. There was a panel of judges who asked questions, and all I had to do was answer them verbally. Easy peasy. Now I just need to wait for the results. The next day, I went to school as usual, but then suddenly was called to the principal's office. Dr. Lewis might have known about that competition and saw my name on the top list. I was about to brag about my performance when he accused me of helping other students cheat on their exam. Then he showed me a voice recording of me answering the questions. Wasn't that for the intelligence contest? But Laura said, Dr. Lewis, just wait. I can explain. I frantically called Laura, but she refused to pick up. Enough. I'm so disappointed in you. You're expelled from this moment. 
Feeling lost and crushed, I trudged myself to a bench in the schoolyard. Hey, are you okay? Okay? You're mocking me? Now that project slot is yours. Happy much? Get out of my sight, now! Suddenly, a stack of papers fell onto my lap. You might need this. Good luck. I believe you're not a cheater. I confusedly flipped through those papers to see that these were all of Henry's notes from the semester for practice lessons, which could not be found in normal textbooks or lectures. I kept on turning to the last page and saw a scribble. Know your worth. Something awakened inside me, so I swallowed my pride and ran after Henry. Hey, wait! I I've been wrong about you the whole time. I'm sorry. Don't be. It's my fault to act competitively, too. I had no bad intentions. It was just the motivation for me to study harder. I swear. But it's a pity if the medical industry loses someone like you. Um, well, I'm not so sure anymore. I'm used to doing everything so quickly and I can't be patient, which probably explains my clumsiness. That I can help with. Genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work, you know. Since then, I often went to Henry's house to practice. We studied together and he taught me many tips to stay calm, patient, and focused. And turns out, he's also quite the adorable type. Here you go. Thank you, doctor. This is the best stitch I've ever had. One day, I ran into Laura at a gas station. She tried to hide, but I ran straight there to catch her. How could you trick me like that and just disappear like nothing happened? I'm so sorry, Aubrey. I was so blind and just wanted to help those who are bad at studying like me. I never expected it to be that serious and you'd get expelled. And now, why are you here? It's just the medical profession was not my thing, so I quit. But Aubrey, please forgive me. I'm really ashamed of what I did and you were... The only one who had truly been kind to me. <sighs> only when you set things straight and confess everything to Dr. Lewis. But even so, there isn't a likely chance we'll be friends again. So the next day, Henry took Laura and I to see Dr. Lewis. Aubrey, Laura, what are you both doing here? Dr. Lewis, I... I was the one behind the cheating case. Aubrey had no idea and didn't deserve to be punished for my fault. I've been practicing a lot too, sir. Look at these. I've been so careful with every single one. Aubrey has also helped me a lot in our project. I hope you can forgive her and grant her another chance. Dr. Lewis looked quite satisfied, but then he suddenly turned pensive and shook his head. Medical school is not where people can freely join and leave. A doctor needs an extra sharp mind and can be fooled as easily as you were. I'm sorry, Aubrey, but you're not qualified. My heart sinked my toes, and I locked myself inside my apartment for the next couple of days. It wasn't until Henry knocked at my door that I actually went outside. He said he wanted to cheer me up and bring me to his favorite restaurant. I sat down waiting while Henry went to get the drinks. Hey! But a second later, he slipped on the stairs and fell down with a thud with all the broken glass scattering around. It's all right. I, I think I only twisted my ankle. Not a big deal. But my stomach dropped when I noticed a trail of blood on the floor and something protruding from his ankle. A large shard of glass. I swiftly dialed a 911 while Henry winced in pain. Aubrey, you have to administer first aid. Oh, right. I called for the restaurant staff to get the first aid kit, but it was clear that the situation was dire. Henry's face grew pale as blood continued to trickle from the wound. I held the wound closed to stop the blood, but my heart felt weak. I couldn't bear to see him suffer. You trust me, Henry? What do you mean? Yes? So I immediately pulled out the toolkit that I brought around in my purse. Henry bit down on the tablecloth beside us, and I started the procedure. I maintained a steady stream of chatter, trying to distract him from the pain, but it wasn't helping. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What? Just to distract myself from the pain. Okay, go ahead. Stand a little taller. And done. When I looked up, there was a crowd cheering in awe and admiration. Guys, I caught the whole thing live. The video of the incident quickly went viral. That night, I tossed and turned in bed, unable to contain my excitement. I saved a human life! Reading the comments of the video filled me with a renewed sense of motivation to pursue my dream. The following morning, I was jolted awake by a notification on my phone. It was an email from Dr. Lewis himself. I headed to Dr. Lewis's office, and to my surprise, he told me he saw the video and gently said, Aubrey, I was once like you, arrogant and overly reliant on my natural intelligence. Then, a mistaken surgery left me with regret that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. However, after watching the video, I'm glad that you changed. I saw your humility and eagerness to learn, so I'll give you another chance. 
So here I am. You have no idea how much I miss this hallway. Welcome back. How's your ankle doing? Much better, thanks to you. How about a celebration dinner tonight? Sounds great, but promise you won't need me to operate on you again. I was scared to death. Ahead of me still lay a long road, but I believe the day I become a skilled surgeon is closer than ever. And soon I can perform more life-saving surgeries for the less fortunate. Dad, I will make you proud.